We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Got my tickets for uh, Endgame this Thursday. Had to go to the 10 o'clock show, and I start work at 4.30 the next morning, so that'll be fun, but it must be seen on uh, preview opening night there on Thursday night. Had to go to the 10 o'clock show. Couldn't get tickets to the 7 o'clock show. Good, I guess. Yeah. Do yep. I have to see Captain Marvel to see in the game? Uh, no. I mean, as long as you know who the character is. I do. The very basic idea i don't think you actually have to see it two of my boys have seen it and they want to go see it in game when it comes out and yeah. i'm like nah we'll just wait for it to come to my theater <laughs> <laughs> they're like what 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 i'm like no. i don't know it's a cultural event i think that one is worth seeing as quickly as possible yeah i don't want to sit in the theater with a bunch of people checking facebook yeah that's why i go on the thursday night people usually going on the thursday night are actually there to watch the movie that's why i like that all right no, I'm not doing that. All right. <laughs> this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your mm-hmm. questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash podcast. You can find our videos at youtube.com slash avrant. We are disabling comments on yep. YouTube. That's now, I'm going to just done. go ahead and just, I'm, I'm done with that. For, you know, yeah. okay, it, it's, <laughs> it's very... You know, Rob, Rob is very, uh, I mean, he's Canadian, so you know he's going to be proper or whatever. But just in general, he's, you know, he's very, he's kind of guy who's not going to do anything without, you know, making sure that everybody is on board. So he came, he said, he said, you know, we're getting a lot of political comments on you. I'm like, shut it down. <laughs> and it, like, it was the type of thing where they weren't necessarily using offensive language and stuff. But I'm like, this has nothing to do with our video. Yeah. It, they, you're just using this as a place to spout whatever you want to spout. And it's like. It's not necessarily it's offensive or just, whatever, but I'm like, what does it have to do with anything? And I don't want to have to edit all that and deal with it. So, and we yeah, don't answer I, questions that come to us from YouTube comments anyway. So it's it's bots, it's man. Just, it's bots and yeah, you know, Russian Ukrainian who got who knows what. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I stopped listening to the radio about a month ago, and my whole life just got better. Yep. I turned on NPR for the first time in forever the other day, and uh, and you guys know I don't have over. I don't. I don't watch. I have over the air, but uh, TV. But I don't ever watch it. Certainly, I'm not watching <laughs> nightly news on it. Uh, I don't have cable, so I don't. You know, I'm not inundated with CNN or any of that nonsense. So I just get the littlest a bit about you know whatever international tragedy is happening. I turn on NPR for the mm. first time today. They're having their twice yearly donation drive. I'm like, oh, shutting that back off. <laughs> I just don't want to listen to that either, which is probably bad but uh yeah so we're not going to do youtube comments anymore and i think that's that's just fine well, i mean how, how much was it adding to the show anyway other than well I occasionally mean, I, poking fun at something that was awful so the, the yeah don't really need that i don't need yeah well there's that and the, it's just there's so many ways to get in touch with us that are legitimate yes. and i we don't get at least i don't get Maybe Rob gets a bunch of emails about me complaining about me, but I certainly don't get any emails complaining about me or him. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's mostly real positive stuff. Hey, I got a problem. Can you help me? Very. Yep. That's yep. pretty much what we want to do. So thank you very much for giving us content. Uh, so no more YouTube comments, but you can find our videos there, youtube.com slash avrant. Uh, contact Rob directly at rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. Our Twitter is at av. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Uh, Twitter, too, is pretty getting pretty toxic the last couple of times I've been on Twitter. I'm oh, like, yeah. really? Wow. <laughs> Has been that way for a long time. Well, I but... know, but I mean, the, la- the last time I was really active on Twitter was probably about half a decade ago. Yes. You know, and, that, yep. and, and back then it was, you know, memes and people, yep. you know, trying to be funny and trying to get, you know, people to follow them for, you know, being clever. You know, the kind of stuff that got uh, James Gunn in trouble. But uh, now it's just... Wow, I found I'm angry about a thing. It's Let me search for who that can thing. Be more offended. 
Yeah. That's what it's become. I found, I, I found, I, I'm angry about that thing. I'm going to search for that thing and I'm going to be angry about and it. And also, like, who can, who can cry at the drop of a hat? Like, uh, like, all, uh, there's tons of messages that I get in my feed. And I'm like, I don't only follow people I want to follow, but they're retweeting other people. And it's like, why are you claiming that you're crying over this thing? They, like, this is just the reaction. I guess that's a meme in and of itself now. Oh, this has oh. made me cry. Like, that's a, that's a thing. Yeah, whatever. All right. I don't know. I don't know. People have retreated into the. You won't believe number three. Spaces. Yeah, I won't believe it because I'm not going to read it because I'm not reading your list listicle. <laughs> so, anyway, so uh, let's thank our listeners for the week to become a listener of the week. You just have to support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to www.avrent.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, which takes you to a PayPal donation site. PayPal will take your credit card information or your PayPal information and send us however much money minus a percentage for them. Uh, so we want to thank Jacob for doing that. So thank you very much, Jacob. Yeah, Jacob, thank you for that donation. We appreciate it. We also want to thank our 80 patrons, patrons over at Patreon.com. Apparently, I can't talk today. Mm. Uh, 80 patrons at Patreon.com, uh, including Jeremy. Jeremy was nice enough to become our, I guess, if he just became one, he became our 80th again. So we're back into the <laughs> 80s. Woo! We so, are. So uh, thank you to our 80 patrons. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash Podcast. If you'd like to sign up, think of it as a uh, automatic monthly donation or a voluntary subscription, if you please, uh, as much as you want. We're still waiting for that infinity dollars per month. Uh, but yeah, Jeremy uh, Porter was uh, the fellow who wrote in uh, the week that you were away. We mentioned it when Lee was here. And uh, then that podcast didn't actually post until after the weekend, and he was at Expona over that weekend, and he was like, hey, if, I, if people come up to me and say, I'm a Navy Rant listener too, then he'll donate some money. He's like, well, that message didn't really get out, so nobody got up to him and whispered <laughs> Navy Rant in his ear, mm. uh, which, uh, yeah, n no worries there, Jeremy. But he became a patron instead, or in lieu of, or whatever, so... Thank you very much, Jeremy. We appreciate the financial support. And everybody else over there are other 79 other Patreon patrons. Again, Jeremy, I, I wasn't aware that there was a time limit on that to begin with. And I don't know that I could have done anything. I, I certainly could have. I don't know that I was going to. So I'm still I'm still recovering from being sick that week. But uh, we, if you can't support the podcast financially, that's perfectly fine. We understand that. Just find some if you find some way to support us, let us know what it is so we can thank you. So we want to thank Monty. He made a bunch of purchases and told everybody that it was because of us. He he, he bought from Accessories for Less, Ascend, and SVS, and then let them all know that it, uh, it was on our recommendation. So thank you, Monty. Yeah, Monty, that's great. Thank you very much for talking us up to all those retailers. And this is a little overdue, so I apologize for that. Uh, Christian, one of our listeners, uh, is an audio engineer and has reached out to me and asked if uh, if we would be interested in him editing the audio for our podcast for us because he can't uh, support us financially, which I totally understand. And, uh, you know, this is what he does. So he's like, your audio is already really good. But if you've got you want to you want me to do it, I'd be happy to do it for you. And I'm like, I mean, I, it literally is me mostly waiting around for the program to finish. So. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to have him, I, I guess, really, as far as my work is concerned, it would actually be more work for me to have somebody else do it for me yeah, than it is to do it myself. sending the files over and having them come back and then posting it all that. Yeah, it's, it's, it ends yeah. up being the same or more. <laughs> so I basically said, hey, you know, I, it's really, it's no skin off my back to do it myself. In fact, it's pretty easy to do it myself. But if you've got, if you think that there's some way you can improve it, I'd be happy to let you do it. And I haven't heard back from him. But the, the offer itself was nice enough. So thank you very much, Christian. Yes, we appreciate any offers uh, to help with that. And yeah, that's always very nice that people want to yeah. want to support the podcast in whatever way they can. So thank you, Christian. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's get into some news here. we got some more details with the PlayStation 5. Uh, these were shared exclusively with Wired. And thank you goodness we know that the playstation 5 is going to be called the playstation 5 and not well the actually they they were they were saying how the person uh, it, like purposefully did not ever say playstation 5 they're like the next generation playstation but they're not going to call, call it anything it, but playstation 5 shut PlayStation up 5. they went from P the playstation to the playstation 2 3 and 4 you think yes. they're not going five they're they, going with five they should the only reason xbox did something else is because they're like well we can't call ours xbox 2 when it's playstation 3 as the, you know, yeah. as the system model. All right. <laughs> uh, this is, I guess this was with Wired, sure, with Wired. It won't mm -hmm. come out in 2019, but it's 2020 at the earliest. Yep. A new 8-core 70, what, nanometer? 7 nanometer. 7, seven yeah. nanometer AMD CPU. 
a uh, new AMD GPU with ray tracing. Mm -hmm. I love that when my rays are Yeah, traced. ray tracing is an interesting thing. I mean, we haven't seen that in any consoles before. Uh, right. This is uh, quite a new thing even on gaming PCs. I mean, um, was it NVIDIA's? GPUs, you know, famously the newest ones, the the 2000 series, uh, they're like, oh yeah, we got ray tracing, but it hasn't been widely supported in a ton of games yet. And this is, it's mostly about modeling light because they use this, uh, like, you know, Industrial Light and Magic would use this for movie uh, things to make sure that the lighting looks correct. Oh, right. So it's yeah. that that's part of it. But they're also saying it has applications on the audio side as well, because uh, let's say you're trying to be like, oh, should I be able to hear that enemy who's on the other side of the wall? And they use the ray tracing to say, oh, this this sound path could find its way to your character's ears, you know, through this window or through this open uh, door or whatever. And so the ray tracing can be used on the audio side as well. So that's kind of cool. So it's going to have custom object-based audio and hardware uh, intended as a virtualized surround sound with the gold standard being the headphone playback yeah so that was a uh, interesting that they put it that way they they uh sort of went out of their way to not say dolby atmos or dtsx it's like it's their own sony uh proprietary object based audio format uh yeah. that you know of course is going to be being mixed in real time in the games and interesting that they're not necessarily targeting it at an 11 speaker array they're like most people are probably using two speakers or headphones and so it's all virtualized sound to make things come from above you and below you and around you and all that <sighs> It's a bit like Windows Sonic, right? Microsoft has Windows Sonic. Just or their Dolby version. headphones, I suppose. But yeah, why Sony? Why I don't know. Why not just use Atmos? I don't, why not just use anything other than virtualized sound? <laughs> uh, current uh, PlayStation VR will work on the new console. Specialized uh, solid state drive, the hard drive they'll have, uh, to drastically reduce load times. Mm -hmm. Up to 8K resolution output. Backwards compatible with PS4 games for now. Maybe if we, unless we change our mind, and uh, it still has an optical disc drive. So yeah, so I mean that's they they made it's got to be ultra because... HD though, right? It's got to be ultra HD. I don't know. They didn't I mean, specifically say that. You would think just for the storage alone, they would want it to be yeah. Start I mean, having four K really and eight K resolution games. You're going to need all the storage. But uh, no, I mean that that was a clear thing because so Microsoft just brought out their uh, Xbox One S All Digital Edition, or you know as we like to shorten that Xbox One Sad because hmm. that's what the letters work out to. Uh, but you know removing so we got the, the X Bone, the X Bone Sad. X -bone Bone sad, yep. Uh, because you know, they're removing the uh, optical disk drive from that, making it so that it only works with downloadable games, and then all of the things like you've got uh, Google Stadia, which is going to be, you know, you barely even need hardware. The all the number crunching is being done on Google servers, and then they're just streaming <coughs> the game to you. And then Xbox, Microsoft seems to be moving in that sort of direction as well this idea that maybe you'll just be streaming the game so this is clearly on sony's side saying no playstation 5 is going to be some beast of a hardware unit we are not talking about streaming the games to you although i mean they already have playstation now but right you know the thing is they have more experience running playstation now for several years at this point and they're like yeah, we're probably really just not there yet as far as streaming high-end Twitch-based games. We just, we're not there yet, so yeah. they're going to put out a powerful machine, and that's where they're I going. Mean, I mean, I honestly think it's a terrible idea to try to to rely on streaming for, I I mean, you know, for, I for a, think... a product like this. I mean, yeah. it, it is a product that people are going to buy and expect it to work in their house regardless mm -hmm. of what's going on around them. And, and hardcore when... gamers don't want to deal with any latency. Oh, lag is like huge. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... yeah, Cas the Casual gamers won't care. But yeah. uh, they're all going to be like, how come it got blurry all of a sudden? You no. Know? Yeah, no, the, <laughs> no the guy that. Wired was talking to, he was like, yeah, we pretty much went to game developers and said, tell us all the things you wish you could do. And it was funny, specifically on that SSD, because uh, they were like, yeah, we know it's not really like cost feasible, but is there any way we could have an SSD? And he's like, yeah, we're putting an SSD in there. So right. who knows? Maybe this thing is going to cost $800 at this point, but... Uh... Oh, it yeah, might even be go. more than that. Who These knows? Their I mean, plans. it sounds like. I mean, the thing is, is, is consoles become obsolete like almost the minute they come out. Yeah. You know, there's going to be a computer that's stronger than it, you know, within months, if not 
at the same time. So consoles by, the, you know, by definition, but the key is, is that with consoles, you can develop specifically for the hardware and yeah. optimize. You can't yeah. do that. I mean, PC, you know, the PC gamers are like, oh, or, you know, PC, everything's more powerful, blah, blah, blah. With a wide, you know, no. tremendous variance, the number of variables that there could be in the systems people yeah. are playing the games on, on a PC. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I only agree with, I mean, I, PC gaming and everything else is fine. It's, I, I, I don't care. I don't have like a, 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 an iron in the fire there. You know, the people, I was just talking with somebody the other day and I was like, it, you know, anything that requires you to hate something else in order for you to love the thing <laughs> that you love, you're doing it wrong. Mm. You know, if you love, you know, consoles and hate PC, then you're doing gaming wrong. <laughs> you know, or if you right. love PlayStation and hate Xbox, it's like, I, Why? <laughs> What's the point of hate of the hate part? There's, it doesn't do anything for you. But it looks like Sony's making their bet, and certainly hardcore gamers have reacted positively to this idea. Yeah, there's uh, no this way it, and... this thing's coming out with all this crap. There's just no way. <laughs> there's, it's not going to happen. Something's going to give. The well, backwards I... compatibility number one is like the first thing on the chopping block. Oh, well, other than that, I maybe mean, that since, hard since drive. They base, there's the PlayStation Four is all AMD based hardware, so they're just this is the next generation of AMD based hardware. There's no reason why it shouldn't be backwards yeah, compatible. You they're say that, and then platforms. there'll be some reason why there is. You know, their whole reason well, then why. I guess PS4 games will end up on PlayStation now when you can stream them. There you go. Well, PlayStation Four wasn't compatible with PlayStation Three because they literally had to take the chipset out of PlayStation Three and put it in the PlayStation Four. Well, because the PlayStation Three though was radically different architecture. Right. So. Well. That's why they're you. saying this is very similar architecture mm -hmm. to what we were already using. So it's like... A you know, very folder. similar is often close enough in computers. <laughs> All right, Logitech has, a, has launched their new Harmony Express remote for 250 bucks. It's an Amazon Echo in your hand, including a speaker. It only has 10 buttons plus a direction pad. You do almost everything by talking to it instead. It comes with a hub and an additional mini IR blaster, but the new hub only works with the Express. You can't use any previous Harmony remotes with the Express hub, and you can't use the Express remote with uh, previous Harmony hubs. Mm. That's convenient. There's yeah. also a new Express app for setup. Same deal. Only works with Express remote. You can program 15 devices but that can also control anything a regular echo can control and you can pair it with any other echo for completely hands-free control using the express uh, requires you to press the main blue ringed button instead of saying the wake word well that's that is smart finally yes yeah, yeah you so waking it up you have to press the button which actually you know some people are like well that's a lot better because when a movie is playing sometimes you're like trying to shout to your echo and i can't hear you over how loud your speakers are yeah. this thing you press the button it knows to listen so uh yeah. there's that um yeah i mean this wouldn't be to my personal liking because i want something where i have individual device control right um you know i want more hard buttons than that so you know this isn't necessarily for me but for a lot of people this makes sense uh it's uh, David Katzmeyer spent some time uh, using it over at CNET and wrote up his impressions. And he was like, yeah, for his kids, for his wife and that, they really liked it. It was simpler. It was easier to talk to it. They're already used to talking to she who shall not be named uh, from Amazon over there. And yeah, it, you know, it's it's a, a different way of coming at it. And unlike Amazon's own Fire Cube, this is able to control all the things that are already in Logitech's database, which is a right. tremendous number of products. Right. Uh, so it's combining... Uh, yeah, Amazon's voice assistant with uh, Logitech's expertise in remotes. That seems like a good union. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, I don't really have an opinion on it. Hmm. I, I'm I mean, I just, I, I'm hoping that Logitech's existing remotes continue to be you know, improved upon that, that this isn't the only harmony that we have, because I wouldn't be happy if that were the case. Yeah, but as long as like they... Go down both paths. It seems like the zeitgeist right now is a lot of people saying, oh, is she listening to us all the time? Like, There's that. Well, just, at least it isn't listening until you press the button. So there's well, that I, much. You know? I, just, I just find it to be so, it's such a pointless argument. You know, I've got <laughs> friends who, who have them and won't plug them in. Right. Because they're like, well, I don't want, I don't want you know, to Amazon listening upon. to me. All, like, what do you think that they're doing? That <laughs> What are you doing that you think that anyone outside of yourself would care about it you know i'm not saying that that that, that giving up control over your privacy or whatever mm -hmm. is something you should do lightly but you're kind of being stupid i mean <laughs> the, the, real, i mean if there's the microphones on all the time hearing everything you say in your house and uh you know i, mean, I, th I would think that somebody would be able to say 
you know, somebody would have tested the dang thing by now and said, yes, not only is it is it here, is it listening for the keyword, mm-hmm. and then, but it's also sending back everything. You know, there's a data stream coming out of the thing that's sending it back. Somebody would have tested for that and found that that was happening because that's what would they even do with all that data? What what would they even do? What would be the point? Surveillance. Uh, yeah, surveillance. <laughs> The same, this, the, the same population. These are the same people who are like, I don't have a Facebook account because I don't want mm-hmm. to give up my personal information. Yeah, okay. You know that they tell you to use your real name, but they have no way of knowing if you do or not. You could put whatever name you want in there. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. <laughs> Brian, this is from Brian. Amazon and Google have decided to reduce their feuding. Amazon Video Prime, uh, I'm sorry, Prime Video will be coming to Chrome, uh, Chromecast and Android TV, and YouTube will be coming to Amazon Fire devices later this year. In both cases, Amazon still won't be selling Google Home devices on Amazon.com, though. Whatever. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's been a weird feud for a long time. You know, you pick up a Chromecast and you're like, oh, hey, I'll you know turn on my Amazon Prime Video, and it's not there. Or you pick up an Amazon Fire TV and you're like, yeah, let's check out YouTube, and YouTube isn't there because they've been feuding. So uh, I don't understand how you. I mean, I can understand how you can get away with not having Amazon Prime Video because who uh-huh. really cares? I mean, there's a couple of shows on there that I care about now, but generally speaking, it's kind of garbo. And uh, but YouTube, man, I mean, my kids live on YouTube. <laughs> But it all all started because, you know, Amazon won't sell Google's voice assistant devices on Amazon.com because they have their own voice assistant. And then Google's like, well, if you're not going to do that, then we're not going to let you have YouTube. And so, yeah. But now both of them are like taking a look at Disney Plus coming over the horizon. They're like, "Mm, maybe we should stop fighting with each other because we're both going to get gobbled up as far as our (laughs) video streaming services go. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I finished the three seasons of The Expanse. I don't know if there's any more seasons of The Expanse. I don't know if they're going to come up with any more of that. It kind of seemed like it was at a stopping point. It was mm-hmm. really good. If you haven't watched, if you're into sci-fi and you haven't watched The Expanse, you should. It's sort of like low, low end Game of Thrones in space. Okay. It's not quite as deadly as Game of Thrones, but you know, it's certainly got some uh, some interesting things happening in it. So I I liked it quite a bit. And now I'm watching Hannah, which is that. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, on Amazon Prime. The Amazon Prime and the. Lip sync is sometimes better and sometimes worse. You know. <laughs> Lastly, in the news, uh, Netflix is beta testing a shuffle mode that's only on Android mobile app uh, at the moment, and it may or may not be a per- become a permanent feature, You, but you can't decide what to watch. Just hit shuffle, and Netflix will play a random episode of a popular show. Yep. So, you know, SpongeBob. Maybe. Pokemon. <laughs> right on the on the picture the they're office. showing, they got uh, New Girl Office. Yep, that's in there. Looks like Arrested Development. I, I, the last thing I want, especially like Arrested Development, which is more, I mean, it's from my recollection, kind of serialized. I mean, right. It's not like standalone episodes. New Girl, The Office, those are kind of standalone episodes. But, you know, Arrested Development, like, okay, what's happening? You know, it's <laughs> like having Farscape get shoved in there. What? Who are these people? <laughs> there's, there's just no way. All right, some comments here. Carl knows that AVS Forum's IMAX Enhanced Guide that includes a hub to explain the format and its features, a glossary of terms, and a product guide listing all IMAX Enhanced hardware currently available for purchase. Outside of saying that you'll get the best experience and that the displays and receivers and preposts have a dedicated IMAX Enhanced mode, there's still no detailed explanation of what makes IMAX Enhanced any different from regular 4K HDR and DTSX content. And since Sony is still the only display manufacturer listed at the moment, ironically, you can't even watch it in HDR 10 Plus, which is the dynamic metadata HDR format offered in every IMAX enhanced Ultra HD Blu ray so far. Yep. So, yay. So, for- if you're interested in IMAX enhanced, that's good. AVS Forum has this hub that is specifically dedicated to IMAX enhanced and all of its various actual products that you can get and glossary of terms and that that you can look at. But, uh, yeah, we're still trying to figure out exactly what makes any of it different from standard DTSX and HDR. It's an interesting, interesting I, I, thing. I would, you know, I, I, this whole. <sighs> it's I, I think it's I think it would be enough to say that IMAX enhanced was just IMAX uh, mixed or IMAX uh, formatted right. or well, I mean, and it is. I mean, it's 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 remastered. That's what I, that's the word. Yeah. I, that's the word I was looking for. Remastered by IMAX, I think would yeah. be better than IMAX enhanced. Mm. IMAX enhanced kind of tells you that they're doing that that that, that, that there's some technology more than in, in right. 
you've already got or all that the technology. it's somehow a different format it's it neither isn't. of those things it's just yeah. if it was just you know super it's like super bit you yeah. know I, I think if they just marketed it that way it'd be a lot less confusing and a lot more i think uh desirable no, I think it's I, also it's also the I thing where be. when your television goes into IMAX enhanced mode, it's it's exactly the same. People have tested it, and it's exactly the same as putting it into cinema mode. Yeah, well, yeah. But it's, it's just something because people should do anyways. But yeah, uh, because so just, many people out there they buy the TV and they leave it in vivid mode, they leave it in dynamic mode, and yes. so this is saying at least okay, it's an IMAX enhanced disc. I bought an IMAX enhanced branded TV and an IMAX enhanced branded AV receiver, and it goes into IMAX enhanced mode, and well, I'm the person. Who likes watching in vivid mode so i think everything looks way too dark and i probably turned it off at this point but at least that's i i am aware now that that's how it was supposed to look is the imax enhanced mode which is the same as the cinema mode joseph on twitter got a dyne dymo rhino 52 dymo rhino 5200 label maker it can print on heat shrink tubing so he made custom later labels for speaker wires in his den he asks too organized nope <laughs> you want to come to my house nope. and do it Feel free, because uh, that's a rat's nest back there. Yeah, I, I don't to... have labels on anything. I rely on memory. <laughs> I do worse than that. I, like, Great. plug everything in, and then I take the wires, and I touch it to, like, a, tri a double A battery. I'm like, right. oh, tell my kids moved. Tell, tell my kids to go stand next to speakers, and they tell they put their hands up when they get to the one that moved. <laughs> uh, lastly, Jay posted on Facebook that he started listening to AV Rent at uh, 432 with the intention to listen in chronological order. He started in late January, and now he's up to 491. Aren't we in the 600s? We are. We are at 640 now, yes. So he's thinking he might need to start listening to our newest episodes while catching up on the back catalog in between so they won't be too far behind in terms of model numbers and such. Dude, you do you. I don't care how you listen to the podcast as long as you do. So, we, will, we will say welcome to you whenever you arrive at episode yes. number 640. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, questions here. Infinite Gary, when Lee uh, started his throwback photo, uh, shared his throwback photo of his 1990 setup that included a 27-inch CRT, CRT TV, it reminded Gary of, of his first time seeing a 16 by 9 aspect ratio TV at Best Buy and how the 28-inch 16 by 9 TV looks so much smaller than the 27-inch for the three Sony he had at home. Since most of the content was still in 4.3 at the time, how much larger uh, in the screen area was the 27 inch 4x3 TV versus what is being shown on a 28 inch 16x9 TV? That's a geography question. I mean, geometry question is what that is. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a pure math question, but yeah. uh, I'll go through the numbers so that we are aware and explains why the 28 inch, <coughs> even though it's 28, which is a larger number than 27, uh, but being 16x9 looks smaller than the 27 inch. So the 27 inch 4x3 aspect ratio TV would have been 21.6 inches wide and 16.2 inches tall. Right. That would be the uh, dimensions of the 4x3 image, giving you uh, 349.92 square inches of screen area when showing 4x3 content. So the 28-inch 16x9 television physically would have been 24.4 inches wide, so it's wider. 4x3 right. one was 21.6. This is 24.4 inches wide, but it's only 13.73 inches tall. So it's shorter, right? The 4x3 one was 16.2 inches tall. Right. The 16x9, even though it's 28 inches diagonally, is 13.73 inches tall. So the 4x3 area within that 16x9 screen is only 18.3 inches wide by 13.73 inches tall, giving you 251.25 square inches of screen area when you're watching 4x3 content. So basically 250 square inches versus 350 square inches. So the 27 inch 4x3 aspect ratio of the screen area is 1.39 times larger than the 4x3 screen area shown within the 16x9 28 Yeah, but what TV. was the 16x9? Do I have to do that math myself? Uh, twenty four point four times thirteen point seven three. Uh, what's that? Here, bring up your calculator. <laughs> I'm not doing. I'm not doing it on my computer. Twenty four point four times thirteen point seven three gives you three hundred and thirty five square inches. So it was a. It was slightly smaller in the it's overall. It's slightly smaller, no matter what. But uh, yeah, so it, it did. Look, I remember when they came out. I was like, that's weird. But well, because uh, they're shorter. They're shorter. You, you, right. You're looking at the screen height, and they are shorter. They're just wider. Yeah. 
Next, he asked at the recent NAB, or National Association of Broadcasters Convention, that Sony showed off a modular crystal LED, their version of a micro LED display with a 16K resolution. Yes, that's what they said. They called it a 16K display. Yeah. At 17 feet tall is the largest self-admissive display yet. And of course, they were touting the 16K resolution, saying it's almost quasi-virtual reality experience. <laughs> Which is pretty much what they've said since DVDs came out. Like Isn't DVDs, that what we said with HD? It, yeah, HD is just like looking through a window. Uh, I it's remember almost three-dimensional. When I got my first HD TV, I literally said those words. Yep. I was like, this is like looking out of a window. This is amazing. That's right. And then we said the same thing with full HD when it was 1080p, and we yeah. said it again with 4K. But now it's almost like virtual reality looking at 16K resolution. They said that, and that even 8K on a big display is almost mesmerizing. That's yeah, that's right. 8K, you know, all of us, we're so blasé with our 8K televisions at this <laughs> point. It's almost mesmerizing, but not like 16K would be. That's Whatever. truly mesmerizing until 32K comes out, you know. Yeah. It's only intended for commercial purposes right now, but it seems to Gary that the march to ever higher resolutions is just an inevitable part of always needing something new to sell to customers. Could 16K displays actually provide any benefit to consumers at home? Would it actually enhance wa uh, watching a movie or sporting event in your living room? I mean, I still don't think 4K is worth it. So, <laughs> not just on the pure resolution. No, yeah. I really don't. I really no. don't care about the number of pixels at this point. Well, yeah. okay, and this is this is the reality. Okay, so Gary, you're like, oh, you know, that they're constantly telling these higher resolutions. Yes, at some point, Joe Consumer is going to catch up with Rob and I, and or Rob and me, and uh, they're going to realize that those numbers don't mean anything. Yeah. I think right. we're getting there already. I think already I think, a lot of consumers are starting to be like, 8K? Like, I just, I don't care. That yeah. doesn't mean anything. At well, they point. look at it and you can't see any difference. You can't see any difference between the 4K, 4K and, and 8K. 8K yeah. You're like, fuck. They can't, but most of them can't, including me, unless you're sitting on top of the thing. You can't see the difference between 1080p and 4K. And 4K, yeah. So, you know, the resolution is, is getting to the point where people are like, I just need to know that it's got good resolution. Same yes. thing with receivers. Remember receivers that used to be like, we're at, we have 105 watts. Oh, we have 100 watts. No one really seems to talk about that anymore. <laughs> you know, it's just like you have to have 100 watts. Once you once you can finagle the number so you got 100 watts in your receiver, that's enough. No one cares if you have 100 or 110. They well, more than all of that, I mean, this specific crystal LED display that they were showing, it was AV Forums that was highlighting this, so I'm right. borrowing their image to show here. But it it isn't a 16K display because it isn't uh, twice the height. This is two 8K displays side by side. It's ultra wide, right? Uh, it's 17 feet tall, but it was like 62 feet wide. So this is like taking two 8K displays and putting them side by side. Now, yes, the horizontal re resolution ends up being 16K because you put two 8K side by side, but you didn't double the height. So this isn't four times 8K. It's only two times 8K. Right. It's just you put them side by side. So, yeah, the whole, you know, this shouldn't be any different than if you just <coughs> split, you know, you drew a line down the middle of this thing and said, oh, there's an 8K display on the left and an 8K display on the right. It's exactly that same thing. So, and it's quasi-virtual uh, reality because it's so freaking large it's so that wide it that wraps you walk, around yeah, you. Yeah, fills of course. your whole peripheral vision. Sure. Okay. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, all of that is 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 silliness but going back to i mean again this was a modular display this thing isn't one gigantic you know panel it's a whole bunch of small tablets that are stitched together uh with no bezels so that you don't see the seams as long as you're about 10 feet away from the thing and for commercial purposes that makes perfect sense um but yeah i'm going back to that same thing of i really don't think exact resolutions are going to matter in the very near future i do think these modular displays are going to be something that we eventually have in our homes i think it makes too much sense to not happen right? yeah uh you know not necessarily next year but i think in the not that distant future we're going to have modular displays and at that point each module has whatever resolution it has the pixels are as close together as however they are you yeah. stitch them together into the screen size and shape that you want and you're going to end up with some total resolution that doesn't exactly fit into ultra hd or 8k or 16k or whatever but we're not going to care about that the pixels are close enough together right. that our eye can't tell and you're going to have going to have to have good scaling and whatever content comes in it's going to get scaled to I whatever you've put together 
the next, I mean, it's basically the same number, but I think what Rob's saying is right. And I think that the next number that we're going to care about is pixel density. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Like, people are going to be calling this podcast and saying, I'm sitting this far away. Mm. What pixel density do I need? (laughs) Could be. You know, and so therefore you can buy a cheap display that, mm. that's a modular display that can be huge. Right. And you're sit, but you're sitting 20 feet away from it. So you can't see the pixels and that's fine. Yeah. And it's something like it's 84 pixels per inch instead of 168 pixels per inch or something right. like that. Yeah. It's going to be, I think that's what we're, I think mm. that's the, that's the new number we're going to care about is pixels pixel per dense. inch. Yeah. yeah. Or pixels per centimeter, whatever. I mean, yeah, come yeah. On, metric. Uh, Gary came across a YouTube video talking about Sony's use of quantum dots and how they branded it Tri-Luminous. Whereas we mostly hear about quantum dot displays under Samsung's QLED, QLED uh, brand these days. So is it the case that Sony actually uses the same quantum dot technology as Samsung, but they just call it Tri-Luminous instead of QLED? Well, I doubt it's exactly the same, but it's, you know, probably similar. I mean, they, they're all sort of working on the same things these days. Yeah, there were a couple of different Quantum Dot brands, and uh, so (coughs) Samsung and Sony used different Quantum Dot brands and different Quantum Dot technologies as applied to televisions as well. You can have it where it's kind of like a film over the entire uh, LCD screen, or it could just be almost like a glass tube wrapped around the LEDs themselves, right? Mm. So you can say the quantum dots are like right next to the LEDs and those are edge LEDs. So now we have this sort of glass tube filled with quantum dots wrapped around the LED directly, or we could put a film over the entire LCD screen, or we could put the quantum dots on the glass layer that's past the LCD screen. There's a whole bunch of different ways and places to put the quantum dots and different companies do it differently. But what what is super confusing about Sony's use of the branding of Triluminous is that they have used that branding for many different things, not all of which include quantum dots. I mean, you will find Triluminous branding on their projectors, which mm. clearly do not use quantum dots. Those sure. are using... Uh, either uh, some of them are using laser lamps, some of them are using LED lamps, some of them are using regular UHP lamps, but... Where Sony uses Triluminous is when uh, they started that because if you go back to earlier LCD TVs, they had these CCFL backlights, these cold cathode fluorescent tube backlights, Mm. where that fluorescent light was producing white light, and then it was up to the LCDs and their filters to make the red, green, and blue. Okay. Triluminous came along when they started using red, green, and blue LEDs. Ah, okay. And they're like, we've got we've got three separate colors instead of a white backlight. And then they're like, well, instead of red, green, and blue LEDs, we can have just blue LEDs and then red and green quantum dots. But they still called that triluminous because it's three separate colors instead of a uniform white backlight. And in the projectors, they're like, well, we can take a traditional lamp, but we separate it with a prism into red, green, and blue, and we have three. SXRD or liquid crystal on silicon panels, one for red, one for green, one for blue. So again, it's not a white uniform going through a single panel. It's three separate panels with red, green, and blue separated. So anytime that the backlighting system separates into red, green, and blue, Hmm. Sony calls that triluminous, but it doesn't necessarily mean quantum dots. Uh, And they already paid for the trademark, so they might as well just stick with it. (laughs) So it it is confusing branding on Sony's part because triluminous might mean quantum dots, but it does not necessarily mean quantum dots. Mm. And in their current uh, LCD televisions, like their master series, they're up to what the uh, A... A9G in the OLED series and the Z9G in the uh, master series for their LCDs. Um, those the, in the LCDs, those aren't using quantum dots. They're using this, um, I forget what the, it's a specialized you know LED backlight, but it's not quantum dots. Mm. So yeah, things change on the Sony side. They just have that triluminous trademark and they apply it to all sorts of different things. Whereas QLED, they are specifically talking about quantum dot combined with LED, that is the QLED in the QLED name. So that at least tells you when it's coming from Samsung, QLED will have quantum dots in it. It is confusing, though. Carl. Carl, uh, following on from our discussion about day-to-day, day-and-date movie releases, both Mm. in theaters and at home, Carl followed, uh, forwarded an article about Red Carpet Home Cinema, which has been, uh, has quietly been available since December. It started by the former head of Ticketmaster, 
which doesn't endear me to it, <laughs> uh, Fred Rosen. And instead of setting a price, he let the studio set the terms, which was enough to get Warner Brothers, Paramount, Lionsgate, and Fox before Disney gobbled them up. Mm -hmm on board. Universal, Sony Pictures, and Disney weren't, aren't participating yet, even though Universal was uh, the only major studio that was on board with Prima Cinema, the service that required thirty grand, uh, a 30 grand server and charged $500 a movie. Red Carpet Home Cinema requires a $15,000 server uh, laden with tons of copy protection and the studio set the price for each movie. So far, they've landed between fifteen hundred and three grand per movie. Mr. <laughs> yeah, just hold on a second. Fifteen hundred and three thousand dollars per movie. When you leave it to the studios, they're like, that's how much a movie costs. Yeah. Mr. Rosen says he isn't trying to disrupt anything and that he only expects a few thousand customers to ever sign up. It's strictly a way to let very wealthy people uh, screen run first uh screen first run movies at home and it's more like a private club uh than any type of consumer offering what are our thoughts my thoughts is that is dumb <laughs> and that yeah and it fine you know it i mean it seems to me and i'm mm -hmm. no i'm no brainiac here i mean i'm no math whiz but fifteen thousand dollars and three thousand dollars per movie you could just buy a showing couldn't you just rent out an entire theater for a private I screening? I yes, don't think exactly. it cost that much more than three grand to do that. Now, you might not be able to do it on the first night. Or the biggest possible theater, something right. like that. But then, I mean, even really wealthy people, their home theaters aren't as big as like a full, you know, like one of the largest places that seats a thousand yeah. people or something. They're not usually doing that. And I mean, you can have a fully IMAX branded home cinema now, right? It's $3 million, but you can do yeah. that. So that, why not do that? Um, yeah, but I mean, I think the interesting thing of all of this here to me is that is the price. If you leave it to the studios, that's the price they set. And I, I don't think it is a, any uh, shock that it's basically the price it would cost to rent out a whole theater. They're like, this is how much money we expect to make from a right. single showing in a theater anyway. So that's what we're going to charge you. If you're willing to pay that, okay, we'll let you watch it in your own private screening room instead of a commercial cinema. But it's we're going to make about the same amount of money either way is what the studios yeah. are, are looking at. It's like, oh, okay. I mean, it's just like, Dottie, like uh, I, I, and I haven't seen the new version of Annie, but the old version of Annie where, you know, where Daddy Warbeck says, you know, buy the whatever showing. Of yeah the Rockettes or whatever that thing was, or they went to the movies. And that's what it seems like to me. So yeah. I've actually, I mean, I've seen this happen at movie theaters where I've gone in and uh, they're, they're having a showing at midnight or at, you know, really mm -hmm. late show the, after the last showing, they're having another showing and it's a private party yeah. and they all go in there and, you know, and they rented like, out the whole theater, the yeah. whole theater. So that just seems like this would that would be less, and then you don't have to spend fifteen grand on a server. So, <laughs> but they're saying I don't want to go out go to, to yeah. uh, a, a separate place. I've already built a theater in my home. I just want to show it here. If I want to have some friends over and they view it, well, I don't have to charge ticket prices or whatever. Or I can charge ticket prices. The studios sure, don't care. They're making guy. the same amount of money as right. if they've you know rented out a whole theater. So okay, um, but I mean it's also a clue to. There is this contingent of regular consumer people out there who are like, I want day and date movies. I don't want to have to go out to a theater. I want to be able to see them at home. I want to be able to stream it through my Apple TV. Why can't I do that? Okay, I'm willing to pay $100 to do that. Well, clearly that is way out of line with what the studios want to charge, right? right. The studios are nowhere. They weren't close to $500. Prima no. Cinema died because yeah. they were charging $500 a movie and that, the studios still wouldn't sign up with that. That right. wasn't enough. So, yeah, I mean, I go back to what we said when we were talking about Prima Cinema and, and day and date movies where it's, you know, my price would be like $25 because I'm going to be the only one watching and I don't mind there being windows and I will go out to the theater on Thursday night and see it there. That's fine for me and that doesn't bother me. But there are people who don't have access within easy driving distance of a good theater. That certainly exists for a lot of people. I understand their yeah, being but frustration. They, are they about that. really going to pay fifteen grand up front? Well, clearly, and not. then three thousand dollars per movie. It's just clearly not. But I think ludicrous. I think this is a good indicator of if you're in that situation, you're like, why can't I pay a hundred dollars and stream it on my Apple TV on the same day that it comes out in the theaters? Well, here's a clue as to why, because this is what studios want to charge. Mike on Facebook. When we talked about the new SVS Prime Pentacle Towers, that must have been when I was gone. That Rob was said, with Lee, yep. 
Yeah, Rob <laughs> says he figures they'll be aimed primarily at two channel setup since SVS doesn't really have a perfectly matched center for them. The prime center uses the same tweeter but a different mid range driver material and it can't play as loud. And the ultra center can get close in terms of output uh, and, and uses the same mid range driver material but it has a slightly different tweeter. Uh, of the Ultra Series versus the Prime Series. But SVS claimed that the Prime and Ultra Series are all timbre matched. So is it fine to mix and match models uh, across both series? And if that's the case, wouldn't the Ultra Center blend just fine with the uh, Prime and Pentacle Towers? Where's uh, that extra T coming from in Pinnacle? I uh, know, Pinnacle, whatever. Pinnacle. Pinnacle? <laughs> Pinnacle. Pinnacle. I should, okay, Pinnacle. just so that all of you know, and, and this is, surely I am... I am 50% of the problem here, so let's not let's not say that I, I am in any way blaming Rob. But these questions often get finished very close to the time when we actually do this podcast, and I almost never read through them beforehand. And even when I do, I don't practice them enough to make sure that I don't <laughs> miss say anything. This is basically, right now, this is me reading them for the first time. Yes, so sight reading, like music. Exactly, and I'm making as many mistakes as a sight read, read music person might make, but uh, it's a little bit easier to... To, to tell because, you know, we all speak English, most of us at least. <laughs> I don't seem to, but pensically I do. Um, all right, so the uh, if the tower, okay, so SVS is going to, most speaker manufacturers, not all, but most speaker manufacturers, they will have timbre matching between lines, and that allows people to mix and match you yeah, know, or about as close as they can get, given that the drivers are a little bit different and clearly they have different cabinets, but right. they're still going for their sound. Their right? sound, which yeah. might be a neutral, like if you're talking to RPH, yeah. it's a neutral sound, but mm -hmm. you take one of their, you know, status speakers and pair it up with one of their EMP tech speakers and one's clearly much more capable than the other and you know it has a much wider range of sounds that it can reproduce that and at, at different volumes in the emp tech speaker scan so what does that mean if you were to ask if you were to say i bought these towers which sender should i buy i would say you, you could buy the ultra one and you would yeah, be okay i would point you to the ultra center for sure yeah. to, to match up with these yep You're and putting together a 5.1 system with them I think that they would uh, they would blend fine, but if you're gonna be neurotic about it, like Rob's gonna be, then that's probably not good enough. Matching fine is probably not gonna be good enough for you. So <laughs> I was mostly coming at it from the point of so they've got the prime towers at a thousand dollars a pair, they've got the ultra towers at two thousand dollars a pair, and now they've introduced these prime pinnacle towers at sixteen hundred dollars a pair, almost smack dab in the middle. And it's like, well, they brought out this new Prime Pinnacle Tower speaker, but they don't have Prime Pinnacle Center. They don't have Prime Pinnacle Bookshelf speakers. It's just the tower. And For so now, looking... or did, have they said that they're not going to, they're definitely not going to put anything else out? Because they have not said anything along those lines. So who knows? Maybe this will be an in betweener series before, you know, they long. always who had, knows? they always had it plans for three series. When they first they announced did. that their prime, there was the prime. That was then... way back before, like that. That was before they even got bought by the parent company that owns them now, and that was before Gary Yakubian came on board and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, but they did have plans for three series. That is that is absolutely correct. Now, I just I think I I don't think I'm way off in that they were sort of aiming this at the two channel crowd. I mean, even the images that they show are like a two channel setup, right? So oh, yeah. I, I don't think I'm super far off on that assessment, but it's just, yeah, if this is the tower that fits the form factor that you want, but you need a little bit higher output capability than the prime tower offers, but you don't want the form factor and size of the ultra tower, or this price is just more attractive to you to get higher output. So you go ahead and get some prime pinnacle towers as your front left, right? And then you're like, but I'm putting together a full surround sound system. I want a center that's just as capable. Yeah, I'm going to point you to the ultra center. That makes all the sense. And it's not going to be such a drastic timbre mismatch or anything like that, that I think you're going to have any sort of big problem with that. So yeah, absolutely. I would match the ultra center with these towers. And ultra towers are only like $200 more each. So that's right. It's but so it's $400 bad. more for the pair. So there you go. And <coughs> it's the form factor. They're considerably larger. They have the wedge shape that you might yeah. or might not want the sideways facing drivers that might or might not work for you. So yeah, there's all those types of things. All right, Billy. Billy's got some pictures, I guess, or these are older ones. All right, yeah, whatever. just to remind us of his theater. Billy ignored the advice of the installers from Best Buy following our advice instead. Almost always 
the right thing to do. <laughs> I, I don't remember your question exactly, but I think that you did well. He installed the pair of Klipsch Atmos modules he had purchased, mounted them on this side walls, just like regular on-wall surrounds, and he's very happy with them. All his other speakers are Klipsch, including his dual 12-inch subwoofers, and now he wants to upgrade those. He has it in mind that he would like a pair of SVS PB3000s. This room looks like the size of my bedroom. Just not even my bedroom, my kid's uh -huh. bedroom. So um, when I, I say SVS PB3000s with that sound, it's not because I don't like the speakers. I just don't think he wants to sit on them. But would they be a mismatch and overpower his clips in wall speakers? And what's our take? Okay, there's no way that you need 3000. And yeah, I mean, the we, PBs we are not going to fit in here. Dude, you're sitting so close to the walls. That's where right. are you going to put them? You're not going to be able to where? open the doors. Yes. Yeah. That, that Just physically, they are going to be a problem to situate. Yeah. So, okay, we don't liter see literally every side of this room in the images that we have from him. But as far as I know, this is an enclosed <laughs> room. He's definitely got a door to the entrance. He's got a door that looks yeah. like it goes to the equipment closet back where he has yeah. put his projector into a recessed space. But unless that projector opening goes into a cavern, <laughs> um, and even then, that, that is a small opening for the projector versus right. an, you know like a full doorway or something like that. As far as I can tell, this is an enclosed room. We It was already a, a very much on the small side. Like His screen goes literally wall to wall. Yeah. That that screen is taking up every amount of space that it can. It's acoustically transparent. He has in-wall clip speakers behind his screen. But, I mean, this room is barely wide enough for him to put his three theater recliners side by side. It's barely yeah. wide enough for that. And there's certainly not enough room front to back for more than one row of seats. Uh, so Anything that starts with P from uh, SBS <laughs> is not going to be right for you. I mean, this is a great case for one of their sealed subs. Both... Physically, it will obviously fit much more easily one of their sealed models, but also you are getting room gain. There is zero question yeah. that you are getting lots of room gain in a small enclosed room like this. And the so, yeah, gradual looking... roll off yeah. that the sealed models offer is perfect match for that. I'm looking at I'm looking at your room. And I'm thinking and like an S an SB one thousand probably if you had come to me and, yes. and said I I want to get some SB one thousands. What do I think? I'd say yep. Those would be fine in there. They'll, those oh, absolutely. Be fine. But I mean, he's looking to so upgrade. I, I I question how deficient, if you want to use that word, your current twelve inch clip subwoofers are. Because I am in the same boat. I'm thinking the same thing. This is usually I'm like, oh yeah, buy SVSs because they're the best, and they you know a lot of times they are. But in this room with the your subs and I the clips twelve inch subs are no slouch. Those are. Decent they subs. are very, very capable and decent subs, which yeah. should have zero problem hitting full reference volume in this very small room size. I, I think that if you were to buy the P, the, the SB two thousands, which mm -hmm. is the ones that I would point you to if you're looking for an upgrade, you would get an upgrade. I don't know how much of that upgrade you would actually feel or experience or here. <laughs> or here. Experience I, I, in any way. <laughs> I, I think that you might have, there might be an upgrade in your mind, but yes. not necessarily something that you feel. I feel like don't is my, is my. I mean, it'd be different if you were saying, all I've got is a six and a half inch home theater and a box subwoofer. It's finally time to upgrade. I have this right. tiny room. I was thinking PP3000. There I could be like, okay, let's talk you back down to something more reasonable. And. I, well, like, even I if he be... came to us and he said he had one 12 inch uh, 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 clip okay. sub, okay. you know, his one, it, it, he said, should I, you know, ditch it and get to SVSs? I'd probably still be on the, the, the side right. of Right. We could get just, on board with that. Sure. Just get, just get one SVS or, yeah, you could ditch it and get two. Right. The if two subs the will make a difference. Whatever. Yeah. The two subs is definitely a, a, a doable thing. You've already got two subs. He's already and got two, and I they're clips really twelve inches, which are see. not slouches. Yeah. So, I mean, so the question is, what is what is he actually hoping to achieve? So, I mean, I, I just wanted to mention because uh, Brian W sent in an email. It, it wasn't a question; he was just letting us know that over on uh, Power Sound Audio's Facebook page, uh, they've put up an announcement about their new model. That there are three new models that they're bringing out. It's not on their Power Sound Audio website yet, but they're like, yeah, we're just announcing it here on Facebook so people can put in pre-orders if they want to get it and those will all sell out but this is like a, a dual 18 inch in a 
massive, like, you know, three foot by two foot by two and a half foot enclosure with six inch flared ports. And they Jeez. tuned the ports to 13.5 hertz, right? And they're like, people have been begging us here at Power Sound Audio for a ported sub with an even lower tuning port frequency because our previous ones were tuned to like 16 hertz or something and people want even lower than that and i'm like so much of this is only in people's heads it is 100 I, I don't i don't doubt power sound audio for a second saying that people have been begging them for this i 100 percent believe that yeah. i've seen plenty of those people online but right. it's just what are you actually going like, what are you trying to actually do that would how, make how many times that... do you think that 13.5 hertz <laughs> is being played in any of your content that is not a sweep you invented yourself yeah there's that and and i mean so I, I, coming back to this specific room that we're dealing with you know it's <clears throat> what made you think pb3000 it must be you know, he's looking not, at he's looking at the low the 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 low. It, it's got to be the extension, not the yeah. output, right? There's it's no way you could be thinking that the output is a problem. So it's got to be the extension. But I'll come back to saying, even though here we're not, oh, you've got to go way below twenty hertz advocates. You know, although both of us have subs that can. You know, I've got yeah. PC thirteen ultras in a tiny room about this same size as Billy's room. So it's not like I'm a it. You know, <laughs> don't don't think it that way. But we're not we're not the people touting. Oh, you've got to have this this crazy, literally subsonic. Think about the word. It is below what you can hear yeah. by definition. All right. So I'm not against it, but I'm not one of these huge advocates for it. That must be what you're going after. But you can even if that's what you want, you can get it with a sealed sub in this room. Yeah. Because you're going to be taking advantage of the shallow roll off of the sealed sub and the tons of room gain that you have in an enclosed small room like this. So, I mean, I'd be pointing you at SB 2000s just like Tom would. I mean, again, if we said SB 1000s it'd be like that's completely sufficient, but you want overkill, so I would say SB 2000s. Now, maybe he's just like I want the wireless and the app features offered by the 3000 series that aren't available on the 2000s and I'm willing to pay it. I'd be like, "Okay, SB 3000s then." Fine. I could even kind of wiggle my way to getting on board with that. But PB 3000s make no sense in here. From a physical yeah. point of view, from an output point of view, from an extension point of view is just not necessary. I think we need to talk another person off the ledge here. I mean, I really yeah. Yeah, you you've got good subs and just I know. just be happy with <laughs> I it. Just, I don't think you need to upgrade at all. That's right. Neither one of us <laughs> thinks you need to upgrade. But if you're going to, then if these, you're going to the, the the one you're thinking of upgrading to, you're gonna get them you're gonna, you're literally gonna get them home and go Oops. I can't get these in this room. <laughs> That's right. Like, there's literally no place in this room where I could put these. I'd have Unless to remove. Unless he's planning to replace his seats. I was going to say, you could go from two seats, from three seats to one seat, mm. and then put them on either side A of PB3000 on either side of you. Sure. There you go. <coughs> you know Excuse what you me. do? You get a pair of PB3000s, and you get a pair of PC4000s, and you use the PC4000s as the seat backs for your PB3000s. There you go. Seems reasonable. <laughs> Christian. Kirsten said he started his home theater journey with a home theater in a box when he upgraded to non-junky speakers and subs. He found himself wanting to watch all of his all his favorite movies again. There was just so much more impact in the motion uh, with the upgraded sound quality. Now he's upgraded to a 65-inch uh, LG C8 OLED, and he's getting that feeling of wanting to rewatch all his favorites again. The image is stunning. It's also got him replaying some of his old favorite video games, and those have drawn several comments from his friends, including some of them asking what game they're looking at when that something they've already played before. That's how impressive and different the image looks, and quite a few games include HDR support that he wasn't really aware of before. So lots of video games are being played on this OLED now. Christian has a C8 uh, channel logo protection turned on, which automatically dims any part of the pictures that stay static for too long. He disables the HUD and any games that allow him to do so, and he tries to make sure that he changes up the image if there's anything static on the screen for too long so far no signs of burn-in and he trusts the reports from reviewers and routines a year-long burn-in testing he also went ahead and bought optional insurance on the tv making sure to read all the fine print and, that, and it does cover burn-in all yeah. right so the guy has cya'd but even with that it would still be disingenuous for him to say he doesn't have any worry concern at all 
Uh, some of his friends have asked about the TV because games look so good on it, but they're worried about Burnin too. And Christian isn't certain that all of them would be as careful with their TVs. Mm. He knows this topic is well trodden already, and he doesn't really have a specific question. But is there anything we could say to further set his mind at ease? And what would our advice be to his friends? And would we tell him to? What would he? We tell him to pass uh, along to them. Uh, okay, so your mind should be set at ease because as far as I'm concerned, you've d literally done everything you possibly can to protect yourself. From it burning. really sounds like it. Yeah. I mean, he, he has I mean, clearly done his research. He has yeah. clearly thought about this and been like, I'm going to take every step in precaution I can with an OLED TV to mitigate what could potentially happen by playing video games on an OLED. So I guess it, it if these were my friends and they were asking about whether or not they should get a, tv like mine right to uh play video games on i would the 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 thought process that would go through my head is you know i know this person i know what they tend to watch i know how much they play video games mm -hmm. that's going to dictate what i say to them that's going to inform my decision like if they play video games all the time if i go over to their house and their tv is on the news channel constantly or if uh you know if you know they are uh, the type who uh, let their kids play for hours on the end, right. uh, you know, I would I would sit them down and say, okay, well these are the these are the concerns, you know, and point them towards a you know uh, a, a a QLED or something like that, yep. something you know, the Samsung. If you're in, say, listen, this is your alternative. This is going to give you a picture quality that's going to yes. be similar, yeah, not quite as good. But you will not have to worry about burning or any of these other things that we've been yeah, talking about. This is as close as you can get without it being an OLED. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm looking at most people Yeah. do not have a television of any type that is the equivalent of the flagship LCDs or OLEDs. Right. And the thing is, now they've gotten a look at your OLED TV. Uh, which and if they're considering it now, they're looking at that type of price range, which is definitely the upper price range. Mm -hmm. And you can go right beside that. The same amount of money is gonna land you on something like a Samsung Q8 or Q9, their flagship or near flagship LCD. Now, most people, when they were looking at their televisions before, they just they weren't looking at that price range. It was there. It was always there. But most right. people just weren't considering it. But now, because they've seen the image that can be provided, they're like, well, that money might actually be worth it. And now maybe they do go look at that flagship LCD TV from Samsung or Sony or somebody like that. And even if you're going to say, well, yeah, it doesn't have the exact, you know, perfect wide viewing angles of an OLED. It doesn't have the perfect black levels of an OLED. But... The HDR impact, the contrast that you're seeing, the wide color from the quantum dots, all of those things are still a tremendous upgrade from what most people have, which was an entry or mid-level LCD TV. And let's That's be honest, most people these people, from. most of these people who are, uh, and I, 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 I just, in fact, I just forget it, most people aren't going to know this burning anyways. You know, <laughs> There's they're, that they're, too. Yeah, because they're not putting up a full field gray screen and and analyzing it to they're not looking for it they're not levels, looking for yeah. it the way that you are you're looking for it i mean you've actually kind of uh hamstringed yourself if you want to think <laughs> of it that way you're so worried about it that you're going to be paying attention to it whether or not it's there and if there's the slightest trace you're going to spot it yeah you're going to spot it and suddenly start calling people and they're going to be mm. like dude that's like one pixel why don't you lighten up <laughs> i bought this insurance and i want to have it so there's there's that to consider as well they're not going to notice it the way that you are so you know, some of it is is just don't worry about it. This, you know, just just don't make them crazy about it the way that you're crazy about it. <laughs> and some of it is you know, just knowing what kind of person that they are. You know, I've got friends, and and when every time I go over to their house, their kids turn on you know Mario Kart or whatever and start playing, and they play the entire time I'm there. Yep, that's like that could be four straight hours of playing, yep. and that's all I need to know to be able to say, hey, you know, maybe OLED, maybe uh, OLED's not for you. You should right. probably be looking at the Samsungs. I think Samsungs would the, the the QLEDs would be the one that you'd want, and I wouldn't have to say very little more than that to to point them in the right, right. direction. Yeah, you no, know? I I think you've actually done your friends who've who've now seen your TV uh, <laughs> a really good service because yeah. if you now tell them. All right, you know what? I don't think my TV, my OLED or an another OLED is exactly right for you, but I think a flagship Samsung QLED 
right. which is right around the same price, is the right choice. I think what it's done is it's it's now set their mind to the idea of, oh, maybe that price tag isn't so outrageous. Because I really think most people before were just like, all of these are LCD TVs. Why am I going for the one that's $2,700 when there's this one that's $900 and they both say 4K and right. they both say LCD? So what's the difference? Well, there is a difference. Right. Right. And now they're, they're more inclined to understand why they might pay $2,700 instead of only $900 for two TVs that both say 4K. Because for most people, all they saw was 4K. And they figured anything that's 4K has got to be the same as anything else that's 4K. But we know we know there's a whole lot more to it, and 4K is almost the least meaningful thing in all right. of this. I would much rather have a 1080p TV with the contrast and HDR and wide color capabilities than one that says 4K and doesn't have any of those things, right? right. So I, I think you've done them a service in setting their mind, and I would tell your friends to look at a Samsung QLED because I don't think they will be disappointed by that. Uh, okay. But get get like a Q8 or a Q9. All right, John. John would like to install a pair of speakers in his garage. He'd like to be able to crank up the volume sometime. So high output cut capability desired. He'll be using a signable zone two binding post on his AV receiver to power these garage speakers. So no gigantic sub separate amplifier. <laughs> and he'd like to keep the price tag to two hundred dollars for the pair. Although he could wiggle up to two fifty if that would be super worthwhile. He'd like the speakers to be in walls, and he's mostly just uh, browsed the, the selection at Parts Express, but isn't sure what to get. Any suggestions? He'd like a few different options if possible. In wall? Uh, in walls in a garage. I have a big problem with that. Well, yeah, I, I would be looking at those Yamaha outdoor speakers that we recommend on the yep. regular. Those yep. are self-contained. Mm -hmm. uh, sealed. They come, they're sealed. They come with a mount that mm -hmm. you can just mm -hmm. screw right into the wall there. Uh, and they are water weatherproof, so yep. you you can leave them out there forever, and they'll be fine. You could ha leave your garage door open; no concerns yeah. about that either. Yeah, I mean, so if you're looking for in wall mm. speakers for your garage, and you know, Rob's going to have you know sound leakage issues. Oh no, I'm not here. worried about the sound leakage at all. I'm worried about code. Garages oh, well, and off gases are a <sighs> big deal. You yeah. cannot you cannot have a standard non exterior door with a gap under it that goes between your house and your garage. That's against code, because off gases. You if you warm up your car inside of your garage, where do you think those gases are going? Garages have to be sealed, and we're talking about. He's saying he's going to run this off the binding post of his AV receiver. I assume that means if he were going to put in wall speakers, they'd be in the wall that's between his garage and house. Right, right. Not an exterior wall of his garage or something like that. You. I, I'm not like, no, you don't cut holes in there. You don't want the, I don't care about the sound at all at this point. I'm worried mm. about gases and stuff. And since he's looking at trying to do this inexpensively, I don't think he was considering, oh, well, I'm going to construct uh, a whole fireproof and airproof uh, back box system and all this and uh, going to seal everything up and the wires this... are going to come in through a, you know, an area where, no, you know, that won't be an opening for gases to escape. I'm like, I don't think all that thought has been put into this. I hate the idea of in-wall speakers. Well, in outdoor, I mean, if you're going to do like outdoor speaker like this, you're probably going to have to look at something that's uh, rated for boats. And right. th those things don't cost $200 a pair, right. just generally speaking, because they're salt water and everything proof, mm -hmm. and they have to... Th th they have to quite, be waterproof. They have to take quite the be beating. So yeah. I would be surprised if you could find... It would be much easier for you to find something that was just on wall than an in wall. Absolutely. No, I am 100% in agreement with Yamaha's outdoor speakers. They are not in walls. You would be mounting them on the wall, but they're easy to drive. Yeah. They sound good. Yeah, the six, six and a half, six the and six and a half, half inch ones. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. that's the one I point you to. It'd be the uh, AW five nine twos. Okay. Those those would be the ones that I would point you to most readily, and you can get those right on Amazon. I believe they're two hundred and twenty dollars for the pair. So there you go. fits within the price range that you're looking for. They do have uh, their step down model with a significantly not as good tweeter. Uh, in the AW 350s or AW um, 390s, so I'm not as big a fan of those because that's a it's a pretty 
cheap little tweeter they're putting in there. But the AW592s are good sounding speakers. They fit the price range. Yes, you'd be mounting them on your wall instead of in your wall, but come in black or white. You can mount them up high and angle them down like you would a porch speaker or something like yeah. that too. They check all the boxes and it'd be I would be totally fine using those in a garage because I'm not worried about weather conditions and I'm right. not worried about having just put big holes in my walls where off gases can get into my house. So I I, I've, I don't know if I'd point you to anything else. I've run those off of a zone too. You know, Absolutely. the binding posts before yeah. and they and playing into the outside, you know, yeah. huge backyard with very little you know, to to reinforce it. And it they get real loud real quick. Mm -hmm. So especially inside of a garage where you're going to get some reinforcement from the walls and stuff, and it's like, going to get loud. I mean, I, it was this an aesthetic concern because it's a garage. It's a garage. Care that we have, I mean, speakers that are <clears throat> meant to be mounted in sort of outdoor areas, they, they, they camouflage pretty easily those, you know, sort of angle-shaped Yamaha outdoor speakers. I just, yeah, I mean, I, maybe it was, uh, you know, this is the only, I have shelves and I don't want anything protruding. Maybe it was something along those lines, but I just, I can't get past the putting holes in your garage wall thing. So that's the only option I'm going to point you to, John. <laughs> so John also has a TV and a pair of speakers out in this patio. He uses the second HDMI output on his AV receiver to mirror the sources on this main zone. And that all seems to be working fine. But he also likes to play his Xbox One when he's out on this patio. And he doesn't want to have more to move. He doesn't want to have to move the console. The picture and the sound are sent to the patio just fine. But the controller's wireless signal doesn't seem to work reliably. He figures there must be a way since the... Since many people have dedicated theaters with all their equipment in a separate room or closet, he tried connecting the IR extender to the IR port in the back of the Xbox, but that didn't work. He's yeah, about 50 feet away when he's on the patio, so what's the solution? Well, they're not IR. They're they RF. Are, they are not IR. Yeah, they are an yeah. RF connection. Uh, the ones that you get with an Xbox One S or Xbox One X do have Bluetooth built in, but it isn't actually using Bluetooth to communicate yeah. between the controller and the Xbox One. They put that in there so you could use it with an adapter on your PC. You can get a Bluetooth adapter on your PC and use an Xbox One S or Xbox One X controller that way with Bluetooth. But right. the between the Xbox One console itself and its controllers, it's a proprietary RF signal that it's using. And there's nothing you can do. There, there's so, nothing you can do. <laughs> like if you call Harmony and you say, I want to control my Xbox with my Harmony remote mm -hmm. and the same way, that, you know, they'll say, okay, well, that's fine because it uses, uh, there's an IR port on it. Like, oh, but I want to use, I, I can't use IR because of this, this, and this. Well, I mean, it, interestingly, the IR port on the backs of the Xbox was actually to connect to an IR blaster. Right. But so they have was, IR, they have IR, IR out of the Xbox, not but in. But they have an, an infrared receiver on the front as well. Is there? That you can use. I think so. Yeah. Well, the Xbox 360 definitely oh, okay something like that yeah the xbox 360 did i'm not sure if the xbox one has an ir sensor for but inputs i'm not you, sure they cannot that. because of the way the rf works and because of loss <laughs> basically you can't rf is proprietary and you cannot uh like sense you can't build something that senses it and then takes it over basically mm. for, for a lot of reasons and I, I looked into it one time and it has to do with you know uh yeah, you know, there's FCC regulations. FCC about that regulations stuff. and all that stuff. So, just there is nothing you can do. There's no, there's no blaster. There's no extender that I'm aware of. Yeah. It's just move it closer. Yeah, you, you got to have the console. I mean, they, they say it should work reliably within 30 feet, but he said he's 50 feet away. 50 feet, yeah. And that that would explain that. Um, I mean, supposedly with the S and the X, um, you know, they they made it got a little bit more robust. People were right. able to do a little bit better distance than the original Xbox One. So I don't know if you have an original Xbox One or you've got an S or an X. But regardless, 50 feet would be pushing it no matter what. No matter what, yeah. Especially if you're going through walls out. You know, exterior yes. walls yeah you know. well plus being outside i mean if you're literally in sunlight <laughs> that isn't always the greatest for wireless signals either should be okay for rf i don't know why it, was it should RF. be okay for rf yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah, uh, i guess i was thinking ir the um, other thing that you might want to look into and because I, I know that the 360 could do this you could take a kind of daisy chain 360s mm. use one to, to to connect to another one so you could put one you know, sort of out closer to the outside and have it be yeah, the one the, that... Yeah, the PC streaming solution. Yeah, and then... Except that you usually get some latency with that. Yeah, well, you know what? You're playing on your patio. Maybe you should mm -hmm. just go inside. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> no, There's I, no yeah. good solution for this. There is yeah, no good solution And, and actually, 
it's interesting because he says, oh, I know, you know, people have, you know, separate rooms or separate equipment closets. I'm like, but and they face this problem, too. Yeah, uh, that that hasn't been solved. Um, you know, we had that fellow who was saying he ended up running two 60 or 70 foot HDMI cables because he needed to put his Xbox One in his in the theater, room. Yeah. run an, a super long HDMI cable all the way over to his equipment rack in another room to his AV receiver, and then back from the AV receiver yeah. to his projector. So he ended up with two huge long HDMI cable runs because he needed to have his Xbox One in his theater with him to make the controllers work. No other reason it was for the controllers. So yeah, we don't have an answer. Uh, nobody else seems to have an answer. You just got to move that console closer to you. Yeah. Brian. Brian is looking to upgrade his 3.2 setup. He's in an open concept great room. So he calculated about 6,500 cubic feet. Mm, yeah, probably more, but maybe. Uh, and his seats are 10 to 11 feet away from a 65 inch 2017 Vizio M series TV. Mm -hmm. So uh, looks like there's a. I'm a little confused as to what I'm seeing here, to be honest. Right. So we're looking at the TV screen there, and then he's got an L shaped couch. So one leg of the L is sideways on the left-hand side. So there's a wall then, on the left, and it's open on the right to looks like the dining room, maybe. Or well, kitchen? on the on, over to the left is open to his dining room. The left side of the room is open to his dining room. So that's uh, the left side of the L-shaped couch on the left side there, and then the forward-facing part of his couch, the part that's facing his TV, is on the left of the image there. And then behind him, it looks like it opens into the kitchen back there. I don't know. Behind I, I, his seat. For some reason, I cannot wrap my around, my, self, my well, head around this picture. Well, front, left, back, right. I know, but it looks like when you're looking left, you're looking... Imagine oh, you were facing the TV, and then you turn to your left. That's the second image. Yeah, but the showing. L-shaped couch, one of the sides of it is on a wall. So which one's on the wall? Well, it's not on a wall. It's on the half wall section uh, over to his dining room there. And then the back of it is on like a half wall back wall to his kitchen. There's like half walls all over the place. Yeah, uh, whatever. Yep. Anyways, it's open. <laughs> it's open. It's open to kitchen and dining room. And he's about 10 or 11 feet away from a 65-inch Vizio. Yeah. So Brian has a hearing impairment in his right ear. He currently wears a hearing aid in that ear. But in a few weeks, he'll be getting a bone-anchored uh, hearing aid, which he is hoping will allow him to better enjoy stereo imaging and surround sound. At the moment, he has Polk Monitor 60 towers and a Polk CS1 center powered by an Onkyo 686 receiver. He's got a pair of SVS PV1000s handling the bass and his wife. Uh, he and his wife tend to listen at the, with, at the volume with the Onkyo at about negative 10 dB. And neither of them are in love with his current Polk speakers. Brian finds them somewhat harsh, and they tend they both tend to get a bit of a headache if they're watching something for more than a couple of hours. Uh, looking around this room, there's plushness in the couch, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of kids' toys. And a, yeah, he did say that was right after a party, so they don't yeah. usually have quite so many kids' toys out. But he does have a, uh, a fairly plush-looking rug over what is yeah. a hardwood carpet there. Uh, but there's yeah, really nothing is, on the walls to absorb It is absorb furnished anything. in that. Yeah, nothing too much on the walls. Uh, so, I mean, this isn't the most reflective room we've seen. I don't think it would probably, like, literally echo in here no, uh, but just be... from the rug and furniture. But... Yeah. I yeah. would imagine you have reflections going on here for sure. I, I you would probably have a slap echo in there if you did yeah. a short hard clap. I bet you could hear a, a zing, a little a little right. uh, trace afterwards. I bet you do have a slap echo in here. Yep. So we asked what are our opinions of his Polk speakers. Why do people keep throwing us under the Polk bus? Uh, what do we think is causing his perception of harshness, harshness, and leading to headaches after finishing a movie? Is it just distortion? Um. Well. There's so many different kinds of distortion. There is, ultimately, yeah. yes, it's a form of distortion of some kind that's doing that. Shit. I don't necessarily think that... Okay, so Polk speakers, and these are the, what, 60s? Is that these right? These are the, same, the monitor 60s, so I don't think that's the very lowest tier that they make, but I think yeah. it's one step up from that. These are so, close to entry level in the lineup. So, uh, you know, there could be some harshness there, but, I mean, we're looking at a room that definitely has some reflections in it. Uh, so that is going to cause your brain, if you want to say this, to work a little bit harder to kind of figure out what sound is the most important mm -hmm. one. And if your your volume level isn't that high, I mean, negative 10 dB, uh, if that's generally what you listen at, isn't, yeah. isn't terribly out of line with what I listen to, depending yeah. on, on like... That's toward the higher side, though. A lot yeah. of people listen quieter than that. It is a little bit, but you're not sitting all that. I mean, he's only 10, 11, 12 feet away from these speakers. Yeah. So... Uh, 
you know, a lot, of, a lot of things are going to play into this. We can't say for sure what is causing your headaches and whatever. Mm. It is a form of distortion. Could the tweeter be clipping or could there be some tweeter breakup happening here? I mean, very could often be. the reason people are listening a little bit louder is because they want the dialogue to sound clearer. Right. And the reason the dialogue doesn't sound super clear in here, a little bit of, of it could be the speakers themselves. Because so, I mean, what's our opinion of these Polk Monitors series speakers? They're not my favorite. No, uh, if you were looking at fine. entry level, I would have re recommended something different. I don't think they're the worst speakers ever or something like that. No. But I'm not, I don't think they're fantastic. So uh, this isn't a case where someone is coming to me and saying, these are the speakers I have. I wish dialogue sounded clearer or that I didn't have to play it as loud or something like that. Could a speaker upgrade benefit me? And I would say yes. In this case, a speaker uh, upgrade could benefit you because I don't think this There's is a situation where you're going, oh, it's definitely not your here. speakers. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely some upward mobility here. But um, I also think there's more than just the speaker going on. We here. can't see how the center of channel is placed either. Uh, well, we can. I mean, it's right below the TV on the TV stand. Right. And then there's a there's a, a, coffee, a coffee table, table in between the, the center speaker and you. So it could be pl it could be blowing right into the side of that coffee table and not mm -hmm. angled up at all. There could be some issues with that. Yeah. So placement could also be an issue. We don't mm -hmm. know if you've level matched or how well you've level matched. There could be an issue with that. So you be, could be jacking it up to hear it a little bit better because of uh, a lot of reasons, which would then yeah. cause distortion, which would then cause the headaches. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that could be factoring in here. We don't know what's what. So could a speaker, you know, what do we think of the speakers? Whatever, they're fine. I mean, not my, like Rob said, not my choice, but you bought them and you own them and can they sound okay? The answer is yes, they can. Uh, are they the reason why you're having these headaches? I don't know. Maybe. Or it could right. be an, any number of other yeah. things. Yeah, it's not where we're going to say, oh, definitely not. Yeah. Uh, and it's also not where we're going to say, well, that is clearly the only thing that could be yeah. causing this here is the speaker. No, it's, it's in between somewhere in between. Would adding acoustic treatments make a big or a major difference, he asks. And, I mean, major? I mean, how, how many are you going to add? <laughs> you know, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, are you adding just a couple? Because then no. But if you're going to add like a whole bunch, then it could make quite a bit of difference. Mm -hmm. And would it make it so that your speakers, uh, no, that you're no longer having headaches or whatever? Mm. Not, probably not, but maybe. I mean, I'm looking at the back image and the back of your couch is up against, so it's a half wall, but it is up against that half wall. And it's a, it's a half wall, um, like the left is open, not the top, right? When I'm saying half wall for people who aren't able to see the images, right? Like, uh, so th the side is open. This is a this is a floor to ceiling wall, but only half of the back is covered. And then the, I think the these side pictures are mislabeled. They're, this can't no, be no, no. right. I've got it right. I've got it right. So I've... the back one, there's that light, and then the one it's that says back open. has a light. That's right. And then it's just open. But there's no. So he's not. The so TV that, doesn't face the, the couch doesn't face the TV. Yes, it ever? does. Yeah, yeah. So see that little green cushion on yeah. the top of the back there. That would be like where someone is sitting. And then if you look at the image of the TV, you can also see that little green cushion is facing the television. Oh, this so is that's very what, strange. That's what we're seeing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but there is so there's a little bit of a wall behind it. But this it looks like there might be some sort of opening as well. Or yeah, something. there's an other. So like if you're sitting on the couch facing the TV. To your right behind you is just open space, but then directly behind your head is actually a wall. So what I'm saying is that part of having that wall directly behind your head, that's some of it. That's yeah. some of you know the, the dialogue clarity and what might be causing headaches. So having panels right there behind your head, if there's anywhere that's going to make an appreciable difference, that's where it would be. Yeah. I would also put some, some panels behind your speakers. Yep, behind your speakers but, on the front wall. That could yeah. also help. Um, on the left wall there by that little hallway, maybe. Well, there, there isn't much of a wall on the left, but yeah. By the hallway. And then the right side looks like it's got windows in that. So I'm, I'm not too concerned about the sides. I'm more concerned about back particularly. So, yeah. yeah. Would it make a major difference? I don't mm. know that it would make a major difference, but it certainly would help things but like we remember in christian's case where you know you had elac speakers where we're like hmm i don't think it's the speaker's fault yeah uh you know but he was had his the back of his seats right up against his closet doors in his case right and we were like you got to get those speakers aimed properly because when he first showed us his images they weren't aimed properly so we got to get them aimed properly and then he put 
uh, absorption panel behind his head. He's like, that made a world of difference. Right. So it's similar situation here. We got to make sure this, the center speaker that you have and your front speakers are aimed correctly. Uh, you know, we're a little bit concerned about that coffee table between you and the speaker and then be directly behind your head is where we would have a panel. And it could make, I'm not going to say major, <laughs> but noticeable. I will say it could definitely make a noticeable difference if you do right. that. So he put the two subs on the other side of his TV and we found our podcast a couple of months ago. So now he's considering playing with our placement after uh, some more after listening to us for a while. But he has a measurement mic and took some measurements with uh, Room Q Wizard. And, and in his open concept room, the results look good, even with both subs up front. Mm -hmm. He's still considering changing their placement, though. And one idea is to move one or both of them behind their couch. That would move the couch a little closer to the TV. And since this is a pair of PB1000s and a 6,500 cubic foot space he knows full pressurization isn't happening but maybe he could get a little more tactile feeling with the behind the house couch placement so what do we think all right so when you say that you use room EQ wizard and the the, the the results look good do they look good on every seat of that couch mm. or do they look good at one seat of that at couch? one seat of the couch yeah uh and then you've got an onkyo receiver so it's not doing anything as far as uh <laughs> eqing it so you know there's that uh to to be considered as well uh, you know, just taking my, you know measurements at one position tells you about that one seat and nothing else. Right. So you know, there could be something going on there. Uh, putting it behind. First of all, if you got your your couch off the back wall and then put that pla that um subwoofer back there, the subwoofer back there, and a, a treatment back there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be getting some some benefit from the treat a little bit more benefit from that treatment a little bit distance between you and that treatment so that the sound has to bounce through it twice and then come yep. back to you uh you know losing more energy as it does so and becoming less uh less powerful yeah, I mean, I, i'm always in favor of something that gets your seat off of the back wall i'm always will, in favor of that will the subwoofer shake your couch because that's the tactile feeling you're looking for it can it should mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it'll be right there. It depends yeah. on how loud you turn it, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, the uh, kicks in the 60 and 80 hertz range. Yeah, it'll yeah. kick a little harder with it being right there. You know, again, if you're if you're happy with the results that you have right now mm. at your seat you're listening in, I'm loathe to say <laughs> change things around, especially in the open concept room where we don't know where the right place to put the subwoofers are. You know, this is not necessarily... A, a, as easy as it is is in a rectangular room that's or right yeah no, we got, and it's not like this is just an open gigantic rectangle this is an irregular shape you've got yeah, hallways partial walls all yeah. over the place so the the way the sound waves are bouncing around in this room is nigh impossible to predict just from looking at it you know my my thing would be don't move the subs now until you start <laughs> dealing with some of the other stuff. Like once you've got everything else kind of sorted out, mm. uh, then I would maybe say, okay, well, let's play around with these subwoofers and see what we can do. I might pull the couch, like just like, okay, I want to see what it's going to sound like if I just mm -hmm. pull this couch off the wall mm -hmm. and do nothing else mm. just to test that. Yep. And I know it's a big couch and it's going to be a pain, but yeah. Yeah. No, I'm all in Might favor of getting it. the couch off the back wall. So. And we haven't really talked about it, but the fact that he's going to get a hearing aid change mm. in his near future makes me yes. say, don't do anything <laughs> until you've done that. Like, I wouldn't make any purchase whatsoever until I had got this hearing aid change. Mm. And then you you would maybe find out, hey, uh, I've had it up to negative 10 dB because I can't really hear it in this one ear and I was compensating. Mm -hmm. And my wife's just super nice and has gotten used to right? listening to everything really super loud. Yeah. And now I'm wanting to turn it down and she's happy as well. I Okay. The things I, if I were in your theater, if you called me over and said I'm having this problem, the mm -hmm. first thing I would do is I would check the level match of all your speakers. Yep, that would be the first thing. Including do. Sec the subs. Yeah, yes. including the subs. You're like I put them both up front; they're the same distance, so I set everything the same between them. I'm like, it's not always the case. That's not always the case. One right. of those might be significantly louder at your seat than the other because yeah. of the way bass acoustics work. Yep. Uh, I would then check the place, the the orientation of the center channel to make yeah. sure the center channel was. Another was... thing to mention is I, I don't see any type of damping uh, beneath that sub on yeah. that TV stand, which can make it's ridiculous how much of a difference that makes. Most pads, man, most pads. Not expensive at all, but something squishy beneath your center speaker. Right. Uh, I would then pull the couch off the wall and put, take like a, yeah. or I might be even before I do that, just take a comforter and put it behind your head mm -hmm. and have you listen to some stuff again. Yeah. Then I would pull the couch off the wall and yeah. do the same thing. And then I would start talking to you about speaker upgrades. Mm. So Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. That would all be the, that, 
that would be the order of, of operations for me. Yeah. All of that said, we are not opposed to a speaker upgrade in your case, though. So yeah. that is still under consideration. But yes, all of those things first, because none of those things cost you money. No. So what we recommend is a speaker upgrade. He wants to focus on the front three speakers for now, but he does have a pair of Def Tech Pro Cinema 60 satellite speakers on hand they could use a surround since he would like a 5.2 setup. His top considerations at the moment are RBH Impression or Impression Elite if he goes bookshelves instead of towers. ELAC Unify uh, UB5 bookshelves or SVS Prime. Since the ELAC Unify uh, UB5s, oh, I know, I know that, that almost got me. You almost got me. <laughs> are only four are only four hundred dollars a pair. He's leaning that way, but he's read that are somewhat difficult to drive, and so he isn't sure saving hundred dollars is enough to make them this top pick. What do we suggest? Uh, well, you've you've picked a whole bunch of really good speakers. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you, you first of all, I am a hundred percent okay with you going with uh, bookshelf speakers in here. You got two subwoofers. And uh, you 10 know, feet, 10, 11 feet. I mean, you're talking about moving the seat even a little bit closer. So let's call yeah. it 10 feet. Yeah. I don't see you needing to super overdrive these speakers. And honestly, after you finish with a speaker upgrade, the next thing you should be upgrading is your receiver so you can get some room correction that can make me actually help you in here. So uh, I really don't see an issue with you having towers for, or uh, bookshelves versus towers. So you should be able to save some money that way, though you mm -hmm. will need to buy stands. So you have to factor in the stand right. cost as yep. well, yep. unless you're handy and you can make your own. Uh, Def Tech Pro Cinema, I mean, whatever speakers you want to use for uh, surround speakers is fine as well. I mean, you've got... These... And I mean, that that can always be replaced later if funds yeah. become available. So yeah. we're, not, we're not super concerned about that. Yeah. Everything that you've talked about, I would be okay with you by. If you said, I bought the Impression Series speakers, I'd be like, yep, get those. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get the Impression Elite. Yep, get those. If SVS Prime. Yep, get those. A lack of Unify. Yep, get those. I mean, <laughs> all of those are good speakers to choose. And we would then be very confident or a lot more confident that uh, your speakers were not the, the 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 weak link in here right uh yeah i mean the the, the unifies people point out oh they're rated at four ohm nominal <coughs> and so maybe they're more difficult to drive than some other speakers that said they they basically don't dip below four ohm right uh, and almost so, every eight ohm speaker does get to four ohms at some point exactly so they they really don't dip any lower than any eight ohm nominal rated speaker and since we're not talking about being 20 feet away or something like that. I, right. I'm not concerned at all about an average AV receiver being able to power yeah. the Unify yeah. bookshelf speakers from 10 feet away. So no concern on that front. If you like the looks, I'm A-OK -okay with their sound quality. Being right. that concentric driver design that they have might even help you a little bit in a room yeah, like this. It's got Kefs, that. Kefs could be on your list Kefs as well. Kefs could definitely be on your list as well, but no reason to steer you away from the Unifies if they have the form factor and the price that you want. Right. So yeah, if you're leaning that way, I've got no problem with that. I would, you know, if someone were just coming to me and said, you know, I want to spend definitely not more than $500 a pair, but, you know, even less would be better, I might point you to Ascend, uh, you know, because you could get their CBM 170s for $300 <coughs> a pair right now. So right. if, if you're like, $400 is better than five, well, how about 300 is even better than four? Uh, you know, so that, and that's And don't forget that most of these speaker too. manufacturers have outlets. You just got to go to their websites yep. and look for the outlet prices. Like, you know, uh, uh, the uh, appearance that I have, the right. the various ones, there there's constantly ones in the outlet right. store that they have, and you should be, have no problems getting something like that there. But I would say, like the Ascends, one of the reasons they're less expensive because they are very just plain black boxes, yeah. uh, and the Unifies look nicer. So if that was part of why you like them, yeah. Then, if you know, you're looking for pretty, too. RBH is sort of the you know the yeah. best game in town as far as pretty goes. The Impression Series for and they all, pretty at a and, lower price. Yeah. yeah, getting loud is not their problem, so you would have no problems there too. So. Right. Yeah, so uh, I mean any are we any help on that? I mean we're basically saying out of any of those and we've now added a send to your list uh that you can't really go wrong uh choosing one of those. So yeah. if the unifies appeal to you because of I'd show price, my wife and say pick the one you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I would do. I would show my wife and say, "Listen, I'm fine with any of these." Mm. You know, and price-wise they're all about the same. Which one do you like and why? And then pick that one because I if, think that in the end you're going to end up with a speaker that sounds real good, yeah. and you'll be fine. And if five hundred dollars is involved. okay, I, I I might go for those impression elites though because I'm I'm a big fan of those. <laughs> those would be those would be my top choice, but that's you know <laughs> that's that's fine. 
Uh, Chris. Chris got a Denon X3400H and he paired it with an Emotiva A700 amplifier. He ran Odyssey Multi QXC32 and the auto setup set several of his speakers to large and so that's 40 hertz crossover. He didn't tell us what speakers he has. He immediately switched all to small with 80 hertz crossovers. When he made those manual speaker setting changes, all of the sounds below 80 hertz really uh, are all of those sounds uh, below 80 hertz being sent to his pair of subwoofers. He could swear he is missing some mid bass now. <laughs> Um, in your brain i mean unless I, well yeah, they, no they, no not just necessarily that so uh it's not all i mean it's not like a brick wall filter we've talked about this before right. there's some of the sounds that are above that will be going you know so the sub will be picking up some of those and some of the sounds that are below that your speakers will be picking up mm -hmm. as well um i mean if you really don't like the subwoofer setting just i mean the the the, the crossover setting you can change it i i don't know that you know what exactly is going what exactly is going on here what what speakers is he running he didn't tell us that uh, oh elax yeah this is uh this is chris so he's he's running some elax okay well they i mean uh, i understand why they would set it to 40 hertz that's ridiculous no but, i mean that uh, well that's super common though we see that all the time maybe receivers are run it again and they'll give you a different crossover setting <laughs> possibly, i swear possibly <laughs> I swear it does uh but no um so i mean uh I, I don't know if i should wait till the end to say this but uh sweeps I always come back to playing sweeps because, yeah, um, do that. Yeah. yeah, what I want to happen is, is uh, it shouldn't sound as though there's a difference between subwoofers and speaker, right? They are, they are one speaker playing together. You just happen to have turned a two way or a three way speaker into a three way or a four way, or four -way speaker. speaker. That's right. And move and the box from the, it's not, they're not exactly. located anymore. You happen to have located the deepest drivers in a, in a different physical location, but they're still acting as one. So if you play a sweep, it should just be a linear sweep from top to bottom. And what you can sometimes do is you play a sweep through just the speaker and you see how low it can play before you start to hear uni uniformity uh, differences, you know, move from seat to seat as this sweep is playing on repeat through just one speaker. And you will notice that you you might get down to 120 hertz and start to notice that there's differences from seat mm. to seat, which would then necessitate, if you're able to, uh, raising the crossover, not lowering it. So that's, I want to find out what, what do my speak, how low do my speakers play on their own before I start to get uniformity differences from seat to seat. Then I want to be playing the sweep on repeat through my subwoofers and making sure that I'm getting linearity in their response uh, and uniformity <coughs> from seat to seat. As long as I have that, now I can combine that information to set a crossover point that is at or above the point where my speakers start to become non-uniform. Right. As long as I've made sure that my subwoofers are able to play that high while being uniform. Now you play them together and you listen to that sweep. And if that sweep is linear from top to bottom, now that you've gone through that process, now if you're listening to stuff and going, sounds like I'm getting less mid-bass, well, congratulations, you've just discovered that your old setup that you were used to had a mid-bass hump, which is very <laughs> common. Yeah, it's funny. when and, and It's just like the same sort of thing that happens when you get a second subwoofer. Yeah, you had yeah. that one subwoofer, yeah. and you're used to the way that one subwoofer sounds. And you put, then you you, you properly. I was used to this massive boom in this song, and where did it go? Oh, I remember with that flyover with the Clone Wars with my yeah. single EP 500 from Axiom, and the Clone War at the very beginning. It would fly over, and everything in my house would shake. The lamps yep. would shake. Things would shake like crazy. I'm like, <laughs> woo, bass! I got speed the bass. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I put the second subwoofer in, it flew overhead. I was like, nothing's shaking. <laughs> How not come like nothing's shaking? And then all yep. of a sudden, I'm like feeling it in my, you know, everything. Yep. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like the couch is shaking. I'm my shaking. Teeth you know, my teeth are rattling My teeth are rattling. But I'm, my the lamps aren't shaking. I, so right. I, don't, I don't hear it yep. the way I was hearing it before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it's the same sort of thing. So, um, you know. It's like going from I've had a pair of headphones for a very long time and they're Beats by Dr. Dre and now I check those mm -hmm. other headphones and I'm missing a bunch of bass. What happened right. to all my bass? Right. Well, it's back to normal because you know it's no longer being bloated by your crappy headphones. So uh, I feel so, Beats by Dr. Dre are one of the few things that I want to just physically like people are, as I'm walking by them on the street I just want to like grab them and just throw them on the ground. Just well, like, I also want, just <laughs> want to walk around with a pair of scissors and clip the cords on every pair of uh, Apple earbuds that I see. <coughs> 
or just knock the stupid AirPods. Oh my god, head. the air, the new air, the little ones without the yep. wires, without the wires. Yep, those are the best thing that they've ever they've ever created. They're better than the dongles. People lose them all the time. <laughs> yes, they do. Oh my god, it's like it is like a constant <laughs> source of revenue for them. People replacing those <laughs> oh, stupid yeah. headphones. It is <laughs> so stupid. I hate them because when I walk by somebody wearing AirPods, I'm like, I'm hearing more of your music than you are. Because they leak so much sound, and what's going into your ears All right, we're going terrible. off topic here, and we are we're supposed to be done right now, so let's go. So he also thinks Odyssey might have boosted his high frequencies, which, okay, as he's finding the sound a bit sibilant, which was never the case before. He tried putting the X3400H in pure direct listening mode, and he, thinks, and he, and he thought things sounded better that way, both the treble and the missing mid-bass. <laughs> uh, he hasn't sped, uh, spent the $20 to get the Odyssey editor app because he, he isn't certain it will be able to help. Can we assure him that the editor app be worth its price all right so this is more and more sounding like you're you were used to the way that your room sounded before you got all this stuff and, 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 and then set it up properly and now you're worried that it's now no longer good if, if any like the the elac speakers they roll off on the top end so them being a little sibilant bit, a little bit would be would be very surprising to me i mean they have although a, odyssey might have boosted that trouble to try and compensate for that could have of high frequency roll off that is could entirely have. possible so i mean if, if you are sounding more and more like a person that the odyssey editor app was created for mm, yes you know you are the type of person who's going to play with it mm -hmm. my suggestion is don't buy it for a month and live with this thing and try mm. to get used to it a little bit uh because when you went to pure direct you're now no longer hearing odyssey that's right you know, you're no longer hearing your subs. You're no longer right? hearing a crossover. <laughs> you, there's no crossover at all. So now you're back to the way it was, you know, before yeah. you had your subs properly placed and and everything. And and this is now you're hearing all the all the room effects, all the 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 lack of low bass yeah. because you didn't. You know, there's no subs left, and the bass that is being played is coming from the wrong place. So it's getting weird humps and dips all over the place. Yeah, no, you, I, you, you got to play some sweeps because yeah. sweeps will, if nothing else, they'll reveal to you, is your current frequency response linear or not? Now, you're under no obligation to prefer linear response, but you need to know whether or not you're getting it because that yeah. is has to be the baseline from which we start. If you listen to that sweep and you're like, yeah, that's actually really even from top to bottom, it's like, well... You just weren't used to it before. You're under no obligation to prefer it, but at least you know. So you, you got to play yourself some sweeps. Yeah, I'd play a sweep uh, with Odyssey on, and then I go mm -hmm. the pure, and then I go the pure direct mode mm -hmm. and play it. Then and see what the difference sounded like. Yep. If one sounds basically the same volume all the way across, well, you you're there. You go, and if one doesn't, yep. then that's why you're not you're having problems with preferences here. He says if he doesn't want the Odyssey to be applied uh, to the high frequencies, where should he set the high frequency correction limit in the editor app? He thought us heard uh, he thought he heard us say 600 hertz. Is this correct? 600 hertz. I don't remember recall specifying low. a number because it's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so the theory that's like goes, way below the tweeter. I mean, that's like, that's, and it's also way above where we would if we're only correcting bass. So right. yeah, I'm not sure. The throw that number out of your head because we wouldn't say that anyway. I mean, the theory goes uh, for the people who are like, oh, you shouldn't correct <coughs> anything above the room's transition frequency. So right. that would normally be around 250 hertz. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where most eight foot tall rooms will have their transition frequencies around 250 hertz. So you could try that. But again, I'm going to say you listen to some sweeps. And if you're discovering that, oh, Odyssey has actually applied a high frequency boost, or maybe you play this sweep and it sounds quite linear, but it still sounds a bit harsh and sibilant because it is correcting for right. the little bit of high frequency roll off and the speakers are just starting to distort a bit when you boost them back to true linearity so it's totally fine to say you know what i just don't want that high frequency boost anymore so i'm going to stop the correction at 2000 hertz or 1000 hertz or something that's totally fine but you kind of need to know what is going on with that sweep first yeah all right we're gonna do monty's question i think we're gonna be done after this because it's a long maybe one. Uh, so a quick reminder about Monty. Monty lives in Paradise, California, and like most people who live in Paradise, California, his house burned down during the wildfire. So mm. we're sorry, Monty, but new home theater, yay. So we made some suggestions for home theater equipment to replace his former setup, and since he's in rental for the time being, we recommend a purchase that he can use right now and then easily repurpose once his house is rebuilt. So he bought a 55-inch LG C8 OLED in Marantz. 
NR1608 slimline receiver from Accessories for Less, and a pair of Sierra 2 speakers from Ascend, and a PC2000 cylinder sub from SVS. He, aim he emailed a bit with Gary Yakubian. This is random dude from you know Paradise, California, emailing the CEO of SVS, because yep. that's the way SVS rolls. Mm -hmm. And when he told Gary about his situation, Gary gave him a discount on the sub to help him out. So that was above and beyond and greatly appreciated. Monty also picked up a Panasonic Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and he's really enjoying all of that gear. So he says thanks for the good recommendations. As a notice to all AV Rent listeners, Monty wants to make sure everybody def uh, checks their homeowner's insurance to really understand what is covered and what isn't in your policy. He discovered that he had good coverage in some categories but came up short in others. He thought Tom's estimate about how much a previous home theater gear was uh, worth was way too high, but it turns out it was a little low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm telling you. <clears throat> the way they adjust for these things is crazy. And he hadn't realized just how many items and possessions his family had accumulated over the years. You might not think about all of your kitchen items, all of your bedding, your sporting goods, etc., but it, adds, it quickly adds up. And does your policy cover your house's current value or how much will it actually cost to rebuild it? Mm. Those could be very different figures. So he just wants everyone to look at the details of their coverage and make sure they have enough, uh, knowing firsthand now after the ordeal that him and his family have been through. So good reminder. It is a good tip. And yet sometimes people are like, God, this insurance price, you know, it seems like it's going up there. But the whole idea is if you ever need it, my yeah. goodness, do you want to be properly covered? Yeah. So he's in escrow for a different house, but he won't be moving in for a few months. The living room, which will, uh, he will set up, uh, where he will set up the gear he just bought, has an entertainment center built in. It's a beautiful wood piece. But uh, perhaps a bit older as the opening for a TV is too small, even for his 55 inch OLED that he barely has any bezel. So there's some sort of TV mount that he could use that would position his TV in front of the entertainment center's opening. Yeah, there's lots of them, dude. Uh, anything with a telescoping, a telescoping, yep, telescopic, you know, aspect to it would be fine. And uh, I just point you over to Monoprice because yeah, they have be one that extends uh, a little over a foot and a half. So I don't imagine this thing is more than a foot and a half deep or even if it is you can yeah. put some plywood on the wall behind to bump that up it's a more than a foot and a half this thing extends out it's under 50 dollars monoprice's full motion yeah. mount that does that and oleds being as thin and light <coughs> as they are i mean this thing says it can hold up to 136 pounds when fully extended right. so should be no problem with a 55 inch oled so that that should do the trick for a, a very reasonable price so the entertainment center has cabinet doors along the bottom and bookshelves on either side of the TV opening. There's a wider flat surface just on top of the lower cabinet door section. So that's where he's going to put a Sierra 2 speakers on either side of the TV. That means the rear ports will be firing into the bookshelves. Is there anything you should do to optimize the sound? Um, I mean, you could put a little bit of absorption back there. I mean, sure. as long as you're like six inches off of that, you're going to be kind of okay. I mean, but, even... Uh, three or four inches is all well, you really I, need i think three or four inches for me uh, is it, fine if you're firing into like a wall right because it's like open on all the sides but you're gonna be firing mm -hmm. into like a like into a bookshelf cavity. bookshelf it's almost like a little little mm -hmm. room it's firing into so give me yourself a couple extra inches for that sound to to get out uh and then maybe yeah. putting just a tiny bit of absorption back just like right behind it i think would be fine yeah if you put a like some two inch thick insulation into the bookshelf cavity that's right behind the speaker there maybe you put a little fabric over that to make it look pretty can and... i just make a strange suggestion and tear this piece of you know what out well that could because... be coming up that could be coming up because that's what i would do i would get rid of this thing because it is <laughs> an eyesore but that's right uh it will be uh a lot easier to position the cylinder sub if you can connect it wirelessly to the receiver. Which wireless kit do we recommend? Where there's the one from uh, Outlaw, which is expensive but works really well. Yep. And then there's the whatever other one that you recommend. There's the one from Dayton, which normally right, goes Dayton. for 60 bucks at Parts Express. It's actually on sale right now for $52.80. Wow. Uh, I'm totally fine recommending that one for subwoofers because... Those low fits, it's, it's not going to be a problem. I mean, SVS also sells theirs, which, hey, Gary already gave you a deal on the sub. Who knows? Maybe he'll cut you a deal on their, uh, right. on their wireless Let's... kit as well yeah. for coming back and being a customer. But any of those, the Dayton, the Outlaw, or the SVS, all totally fine. The Dayton's the cheapest. So he says if he winds up having this living room long term, we'd like to have uh, gear that suits it really well and specifically matches rather than modifying what's there a bit to work with the gear he already has. So what would be our long term plan if he ends up if this ends up being his living room for the foreseeable future? So he's he's in escrow for this house. I mean, it's yeah. not going to not be his living room if he buys it. But I guess he's not sure if he's living there long term or they might end up oh, moving again. Oh, they might again. end up moving again. Um, right. 
honestly, dude, I I would just tear this whole thing. Out. I would take this entertainment center out. Yeah, because I mean, I'm looking it, at that. I'm like, what do you do with that television opening? Because well, not only that, you're going to be covering doors either yeah, above or right. to the sides or below or, or, or all directions. So yeah, you're I mean, now at, at got best doors. you could yeah raise the TV so it's covering those cabinets that are above the TV opening because the TV is going to be in front. I mean, I guess you could have a a screen projection screen but this doesn't look like a light controlled living room no there's windows on the right side and the, the, you have to, there's like regular old blinds in there yeah i'm not seeing not a be. super great solution with this entertainment center being present i mean i guess you could well even if you try to modify it what are you gonna you're gonna take out the bookshelves that are on the left and right and modify what's in the middle you might as well rip it out and put in a whole new one well right? okay so yes if i were if it were me and I don't know exactly. It looks like it goes from wall to wall, basically. It's, yeah, it's or custom. like fireplace to wall, yeah. Yeah, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, it, you could take out the middle section. Because, uh -huh. okay, my parents had a custom set built for their 36-inch CRT 4x3 screen. Yeah. And uh, it was a custom entertainment center. TV fit in there perfectly, like a 300-pound TV. It took like yep. three dudes to get it up the stairs into their bonus room where it was. And what they did is they just cut off the top of it. They just cut the whole top of it off and threw it all out and then put their new flat screen on top. But yours is not a flat. It, it dips down for the TV. And so what you could do is cut, you know, basically all, all the bookshelf area and up out. And then have you'd have to have somebody come in and basically make that one continuous piece of wood mm, across the top. Across so the top. what you could do is the dip that's there, you can make that into where you put your center channel. Or right. it could be a gear mm -hmm. shelf, you know, for gear that you want, and then take the doors off below it, and then make that into a uh, like a um, uh, like you said, fabric or something that you know sure. IR could go through that sort of thing, and then just make this into one continuous, and then therefore that at that point afterwards, you put you could put shelves above it, you know, just like mm -hmm. on the wall, but it's a little it become more I think more contemporary and more. Uh, a higher ability to for people to look at this later on and say, okay, well, our TV will fit there as well. Right. Not like what you have now, which it's it's gonna look janky, dude. Yeah. It is I mean, that space was clearly janky. built for the TV that's in there right the, now. They built the TV. They put that around the TV that they bought, which is exactly the most ludicrous idea. <laughs> but people do it all the time, so yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, would we change uh, choices of speakers and stuff like that? I mean, uh, it, it depends on what type of look you're going for, right? Right. I could easily point you to something like we know he likes the Sierra 2s. Well, Sierra Lunas could be a perfect choice here because you they're, they're a little bit smaller and you can mount them and you're not concerned about rear porting or anything like that. So, right. You know, Sierra but Lunas would be how, a fantastic We don't know how long here. he's going to sit or how far away he's going to sit from this either. I mean, this I know. is, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, that'd be about it. You yeah. know, I don't see much reason to make large scale changes. Uh, you just go, if you're going to have something built in, I want to wall mount my speakers, but I like the CR2 as well. Sierra, Sierra Lunas are perfect for that. And I'd want a TV larger than 42 inches that's there right now. So we're going to have to modify that cabinet to work with the size of television you want. Uh, we can do Brandon real quick. Yes, we Brandon, can. Uh, imagine you've got a theater area open to the rest of the house. The designated theater area is 12 by 18, which is immaterial. What pair of subwoofers would you want for that scenario? No real limitations other than trying to keep it reasonable in terms of what we physically, uh, what we think would physically make sense in the in for that size of theater area. Right. So we're not uh, going to put, you know, uh, uh, JTR captivators in a 12 by 18 area, even though we're trying to account for the whole size Sorry. of the open space. We're dealing with a 12 by 18 area where the equipment is going to live. So what makes sense there? I like those new power sound audio dual 18 inches. <laughs> dual 18. They're only two foot by three foot by two and a half foot. Yeah. Sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> no, seriously, I would look for a, uh, in, in, in cases like this, I almost always am looking for as much output as I can get in as small a footprint as I can get. Sure. So I used to really like the, uh, I think it was LML Designs used to make the the cab a the, vertical the, the one vertical yeah. one anything Looks that's like more vertical <laughs> yeah so I would be looking for something like that from Power Sound Audio is what I would be looking for okay. and I would not be looking for two oh I I right. know we always talk about two but in open concept rooms I'm much more mm. inclined to go towards one that I just place wherever I can and then pray and hope that the base is as even as it can be uh, at the 
theater positioning at the, at the theater seat, and then I have a phase knob and then play with it. You know, well, I'm going to say SVS and a PC 4000. Okay. You know, that, that used to be the PC 13 Ultra, is now the PC 4000. It's their biggest cylinder. And it's a cylinder, so you know it's only sixteen and a half inches diameter, smaller footprint, but taller. I like the cylinder form factor. It's covered in fabric. That's what I'd go for. BC four thousands. Which has more output, the SVS SB three thousand or PC two thousand? Ah, I SB three. I think I. I want. I don't know. My well, guess it depends would be... on what frequency you're talking about. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, the the PC the SB is going to go. It's going to reach lower, isn't it, than the PC two thousand? Or it's going to be pretty close. Well, so the SB three thousand, everywhere from about forty hertz up, plays about three or four decibels louder than the PC two thousand. But below forty hertz, the PC two thousand plays louder until about 16 hertz and then below 16 hertz the pc 2000 basically plays nothing while the sb 1000 continues to play something right so in the area between 16 hertz and 40 hertz the pc 2000 is louder than the sb 3000 just in raw output and that's above pretty much what you care about right (laughs) above 40 above 40 the sb 3000 is three or four decibels louder and below 16 it's playing something instead of nothing Right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, there's your technical answer. Clear as mud answer, yeah. I think in the end you would oh, be... That's, that's fairly clear. Yeah. It's not bad. So he asked me, Tom, what subs do I own? I have the, the PC-12 NSDs. That's right. The predecessors so, to the PC-2000s. Yeah, it was the, the cylinder before subs that. before the 2000s. Why well, haven't I upgraded? Because I don't need to. And he doesn't care about me, but I have PC-13 Ultras. Yeah. And do HSU subs have DSP protection? I don't think they do, do they? No, that's not... Uh, no. I mean, well, there's it, there's what's built into the Bash amplifiers, but that's not right. really DSP. DSP. It's, not, right. it's, it's not processing the signal on a digital uh, plane to, to do that. They just protection. have like the normal servo type things, right? Yeah, they have the... Well, I mean, it's a Class D amplifier with some limiters on it. So right. they have some but limiters. physically, the in. driver itself has whatever protection it has, and that's... Yeah, yeah, they don't have the same DSP protection as like what SVS offers. They don't have the same servo as what Rhythmic offers, but they have limiters on their Class D Bash brand amplifiers. So they're still yeah. quite well protected in terms of being overdriven. It's not not much of a concern on HSU subs at all. Yeah. All right, that's going to be it. We got one more all question right. for next week. It's from who? From David F. David uh, has, a, has a question in there, and we'll answer you next week. All right. I want to thank our listeners of the week. I want to thank Jacob for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. And we also want to thank our 80 patrons over at patreon.com. Thank you, guys. Yes, uh, Jacob, thank you very much for that donation via PayPal. And thanks so much to our 80 patrons over at patreon.com slash Podcast, including Jeremy Porter. Thanks for uh, you know uh, trying to help us out uh, there when you were at Axe Pona. Sorry and It's about great that. that you're donating in another way. <laughs> and we want to thank Monty for talking us up to just about every manufacturer we ever talk about on here <laughs> accessories for less ascend svs and thank you christian for offering to help us out with the audio that's right monty and christian thank you very much for supporting the podcast in other ways all right for av rant i'm tom mandry and i'm rob h now go out and listen to something once your question answered send it to question at avrant.com Is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.